الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزنا علما Ya Allah, teach us that which benefit us, benefit us from that which we learn and increase our knowledge. Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqan warzuqna attiba'a wa arina al-baatila baatilan warzuqna ajtinaaba. Ya Allah, show us the truth as the truth and help us to follow it. Show us falsehood as falsehood and help us to avoid it. Allahumma irhamna bi rahmatik wa ghafir lana ya Rabbil alameen. Ya Allah, bestow your mercy upon us and your forgiveness. For we will not be able to attain anything in life and we will be the outmost losers without your forgiveness and mercy. Ya Rabbil Alameen, Rabbana Zalamna Anfusana wa illam taghfir lana wa tarhamna lanakunanna min al khasirin. I start how the Prophet used to start his speeches by setting up the mood of the mind and heart and soul by saying, Inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'hdihi wa nasta'gfiruh. All praise is due to Allah. That's a universal statement because everything is celebrating Allah's praises. But the question, are you also celebrating Allah's praises? Are you joining or are you not joining? So, um, Alhamdulillah. Shaitan is not happy about our class today. So I guess he's interfering. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. It's a good sign when the shaitan is not happy, so must be doing something right. Alhamdulillah. <clears throat> so we thank him. We join. Um, did, did the sound go suddenly high? Did someone play with the... Uh, maybe can we turn it off, the other mic? Bismillah. Okay, yeah, that's better. So, alhamdulillah, um, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we praise him um, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa used to start his khutbat al-jum'ah and usual classes with saying all praise is due to Allah, that's a universal statement, which means everything is celebrating Allah's praises, but you don't understand it, you don't see it, uh, but that's what's happening. Now, if you wanna join the party or not, that's up to you. So that's why after he said, in alhamdulillah, nahmad, nah, in alhamdulillah, general statement, nahmaduhu, we thank him. So in other words, the universe is thanking Allah, we join, we join. Um, and why is that important before learning any class? Because if you're not positive with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about what's happening in your life, then you will not be able to learn anything. It's impossible to learn when you are angry with God and angry with Allah and not happy with what Allah has given you and what Allah did not give you. So then you're not in the mood to learn. So the Prophet sallallahu very skillfully, I mean, definitely guided by wahi, starts his speeching by setting the mood, right? It's not even a mood, it's the state of the mind, the heart, and the soul, that, Ya Allah, I am thankful to you, I'm pleased with your will in my life, 
I have no complaints about you. If I have a complaint, I'm just complaining about myself and what I'm doing wrong and what I'm not doing right. But with you, Ya Allah, I'm thankful and I'm happy and I'm pleased, satisfied uh, that you are my Lord, that Islam is my deen, that Muhammad is my prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and I have no objections, no resentments, uh, no reservations, no hesitation, right? So that is the, uh, you know, this just of uh, the beginning of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Inna alhamdulillah, all praise is due to Allah, because the whole universe, wa min shay'in illa yusabbihu bihamdih, nothing but, nothing but celebrates his praises. Yani says it in its own way, we don't understand it. So, نحمده, we join the universe in thanking Allah Azza wa Jal. ونستعينه, we ask for his help. You have a problem? Don't think about the problem. Most people, the reason why they live negative and they have resentment is because they're constantly thinking about their problems. Thinking about the problem is not going to solve the problem. Thinking about the solution will solve the problem. And the solutions, all the solutions are in the hands of Allah. So when you celebrate Allah's praises, and when you think about Allah, one, you don't kill yourself with stress and depression. You don't end up uh, destroying your life with your own thoughts. Uh, you don't eat yourself up from inside when you're not, when you're, when you're just basically thinking about the problem, thinking, thinking, thinking. Instead of that, think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that will make you hopeful, positive, productive, uh, you know, active, and uh, you will live a good life quality. And um, that's the, that's basically in a nutshell, <laughs> the reward of following Islam. We're here to learn about Ramadan. We're here to learn about fasting. In the big picture, you have just to have something straight in your head that whatever Allah tells you to do in Islam, it's for your own benefit, your own happiness, your own peace, your own good life quality, you know, good living, basically. Uh, and when Allah tells you, do not do something, it's for your own happiness, for your own health, mental health, spiritual health, emotional health, physical health financial health you know so when Allah tells you don't do something it's for your benefit when Allah says do something it's for your own benefit so the pillars of Islam they're all do 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 why because you need them right yani we don't need Dr. Oz to come and tell us that you need to do yoga five times a day I mean his name is Muhammad Muhammad Oz and you know he went on Oprah and literally said you have to do meditation five times a day. He named the five daily prayers and he showed the yoga. It's akli qiyam ruku' sujood. I mean, how much stealing can you do more than that, right? <laughs> you know, give me a break. At least give credit to where credit is due. So the idea here is when Allah says pray five times a day, people, you know, shaitan will make you, right? But if someone tells you, I do five yogas a day. Oh, wow, can you teach me? Where, where do you go? Which club? Oh, where do you? How much is the membership? Can I afford it? You're con so that's, you know, shaitan doing his work on you. So wh whatever Allah tells us to do, salah, zakah, siyam, hajj, it's for your own benefit. I mean, isn't it fascinating that Allah wants you to travel the world as part of his deen? If you're Muslim in China, and you needed to go to Hajj, you will have to go six months one way, six months back. You would see the world by the end of the sea. Isn't that amazing that it's part of our deen? Isn't it amazing that 14 times in the Quran, Allah says, travel the earth and see what happened to the nations before you and learn from that? Interestingly, equal to the number of times that Allah said, وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُ الزَّكَةَ 14 times. And 14 times, قُلْ سِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ This beginning, Put it on your Quran app and it will pull it up 14 times. This is an amazing deen that wants you to travel, see the world, see humanity. When you go to Hajj, you see humanity, right? 
So the, the, our first impression is we have to make peace with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is the source of peace that whatever Allah is asking you to do it's for your own benefit and whatever Allah is asking you not to do it's for your own benefit and the big picture is you're unique you're special you're different you know I look at people how much they want to be unique and special and different so they're going to dye their hair a different way they dye their body a different way they dye like they, they do something crazy just for you to look at them and say oh my god that's different right but Allah already gave us, there is no two souls that are the same from Adam to the last one. You are as unique as it gets. There's no other copy of you. Even when there is identical twins, they're not a copy of each other. They don't have the same mind, heart and soul. They just look. And if you live with them long enough, you will be able to differentiate them. And it's not a problem. So everyone is dying to be, I want to be special. I want to be different. I want to be unique. Allah already gave you all of that. Literally, Allah said, I created you individually. This is not Toyota factory in which you produce all the 20, 23 Highlanders all the same time. We are human beings. What did Allah say in the Quran? وَلَقَدْ جِئْتُمُونَا فُرَادًا كَمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ أَوَّلَ مَرَّةً And here you come back to me on the Day of Judgment individually, the way I created you in the first place individually. You are, you are one of a kind. You are unique. The goodness that you can, you can bring to this world, no one else can bring to this world. And the evil that you can bring to this world, no one else can bring to this world. So watch out. Spare the world your evil and bring to the world your goodness. So that's why we're learning today about Ramadan and fasting. That's why we're here to uh, maximize, you know, live your maximum potential in life. Don't they talk like that? That's the talk of the Quran. Live your maximum, but you don't need to jump off a plane and figure out if the parachute is going to open or not for you to live maximum potential in life. You can jump out of your car and help a miskeen, uh, give them a meal, and that will be living the maximum potential of your life, right? So people have, are going to crazy measures, you know, rock climbing and falling off the mountains, you know, falling off planes, uh, uh, speeding to death just so that they can feel fill this void inside their heart and that void will never be filled except with la ilaha illallah forget it, it's not, it's not going to happen and uh, alhamdulillah that we have la ilaha illallah so as we approach the month of Ramadan um, let's take a survey from the audience and I'm going to ask a question and I want the answer I want you to lock in your mind the answer, the first answer that comes to your mind. Not the answer that will make the Sheikh happy. I don't want a good answer, fancy answer. I want the answer, the first answer that comes to your mind. Good? Okay. When someone says to you, Hey, Ramadan is coming in a month or two. What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Lock that. Let's have some uh, thing. I like children because uh, when I ask children, the first thing they say, sweets. <laughs> iftar. Which is a beautiful thing that they remember that, right? They remember the family iftar. Right? So uh, what comes to your mind? First thing that comes in Ramadan. Ramadan is coming. What do you associate with Ramadan? Huh. Bismillah. Quran, first thing when it comes to your mind. Okay. Uh, mercy. Now we're going fancy, huh? So let me take it in a different way. Yes, please. No food, right? So let me make it easy. How many of you, when you hear Ramadan is coming, thinks fasting? Okay, so 80%. This is worldwide. I ask this question in Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, everywhere. I go, I ask this question as part of this course and the same thing the same answer Bangladesh India Pakistan the same answer right so the idea is and that's there's nothing wrong with that that's good right but just one of the things one of the shifts that I like to make in your mind since you came here on a Saturday morning and you know denied yourself your you know routine 
I would like to share with you a gem, like something, you know, one of the gems of Islam, which is basically the month of Ramadan itself. Fasting in Ramadan became part of Islam in the second year in Medina. It was the same year that Muslims took off almost one day before Ramadan, two days, to the Battle of Badr. And it was not mandatory the first year. You either fast or what? Or you feed. And in the Battle of Badr, the Prophet ﷺ instructed the Sahaba not to fast because they're in a battle and he did not want their, you know. And it was optional. So I'm going to ask you a question. There goes 15 years, 13 years in Mecca, two years in Medina. Total, 15 years. There was no fasting in Ramadan. So if I went to Khadija radiallahu anha or Fatima radiallahu anha or Sumayya, obviously the first Shahida in Islam or any of the big names that embraced Islam early or I went to Abu Bakr Siddiq or Sayyidina Ali or in the first 15 years and I said Ramadan is coming. There's no point, same point of reference. They're not going to think of fasting because the, <laughs> the ayat has not been revealed. Nobody knows anything. There's no fasting in Ramadan. So would Ramadan be special for them or will they will be like, okay, Shaban was coming, Rajab was coming, Shawwal is coming, what's a big deal? So here's what I want you to think and I need an answer from you. Would Ramadan be special in the first 15 years or it would be just like any other month? So why would you say it's special? Right. Sah. Jazakillah khair. That's a good point. Yalla, let's have another point. MashaAllah. Jazakallahu khairan. Thank you. Ha, huh, please. Yeah. Exactly. You, you nailed it on the head. Surah Inna Anzalnahu Fi Laylatul Qadr was way revealed in Mecca. It's a Meccan surah. How did Allah introduce the month of Ramadan is the question. So that we build the case in our minds the way Allah wants you to build the case. Not the way we grew up from the culture affected. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right of that he said Shahru Ramadan definition Shahru Ramadan who will finish the ayah? Alladhi unzila fihi al-Quran It's the month in which the Quran was revealed. Simply put. طيب, do we know when it was revealed? Huh? Thank you. Do you know how precise we know? We also know if the Quran was revealed not in which day of Ramadan. We actually know that it was at night, not in the day. That's how precise it is. Do you know which, way, which day of the week it was? Huh? Uh, how do you know that? <laughs> la la. No guessing allowed. But this is, you are right. Your answer is right. And it's somewhere in your head. I just need you to remember. Why did you say Monday? I was born on Monday. Finish the hadith. You, you, you gave a scholarly answer right now. <laughs> You know, I was born on Monday and I received the revelation on Monday. So his physical birth and his spiritual birth both happened on Monday. Do you want me to add? He made hijrah from Mecca to Medina on Monday. You want me to add? He died on Monday. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they say, but this is not 100% confirmed, but it's out there in the books. Was born in 12 of Rabi'ul Awwal. Made hijrah on the 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal and died on 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal. It's out there in the books. Fascinating. But a lot of things happen on Monday. It's a beautiful day. Right? It's fascinating that uh, Monday is the most hated day in the West. 
Do you see how you sometimes have to shift your mind from a Western mind to a Muslim mind? And Monday is not the first day of the week for us Muslims. It's actually, if you want to go how the names of the days in Arabic, they're very simple. They make you laugh. Sunday's name is the first. Sun Monday's name is the second. Tuesday's name is the third. Wednesday's name is the fourth. Thursday's name is the fifth. Friday's name is the day of gathering. Saturday's name is the name of resting. The day of, these are the meanings of days in Arabic. Ahad from Wahad. Al-Ithnayn from Ithnayn. Al-Thulatha from Thalatha. Al-Arbi'a from Arba'a. Al-Khamis from Khamsa. Al-Jumu'a from day of gathering. Accept the day of resting. And then you go back to Al-Ahad. So until now, in Jordan, the first day of the week is Sunday. So the day of weekend is Friday and Saturday. And in many Muslim countries it's like that. So it's the second day of the week if we go by numbers. right? So you know, just shifting your mind to think the right ways because this affects your rhythm, your, your weekly rhythm, right? Um, the best day of the, of the week is by no, with no discussion based on the hadith afdhalu al-ayyami inda Allah yawm al-jum'ah this day in the eyes of Allah is the day of Jum'ah so now we're coming to the month of Ramadan you basically now gave an answer with the hadith so you didn't have to guess and I knew it was in your head and it was in your head you see you just had to pull it so the idea is Rasulullah sallallahu when he was asked why do you fast on Monday that's a day that I was born in and that's a day that I received the revelation in I also want to show you like a mind shift, the way we, a mind shift, that way, the way we, we think versus others think. What's the tradition in the Western world when it's your birthday? What do you do? You make a party? And w w what's the highlight of the party? Cake, a lot of food, صح? Look at the Muslim mindset. The day you was born, the day you fast, the opposite of eating. Mind shift, right? So this is the way Islam makes something out of you. So the day you're thankful to Allah. So basically Rasulullah said that I am thankful to Allah. How do I express my gratitude that I was born? I will fast. So that shows you, because these are the major two days in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, the day he was born and the day he received the revelation. So that gives you now a new understanding for Ramadan that maybe you've never heard before, but you should hear it from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Fasting is a form of thankfulness. When you're fasting, you're thankful. And I never understood that until I went to India. I think 2014, 2015, 2016, three days. Visited, mainly my resi residence was in Hyderabad, right? And then for the first time I came Second time, I came face to face. First time I saw uh, Hindu temples was for the Hindu minority in Malaysia, but the second time in India. So I said, I want to see what's going on. So I walked into one of the uh, temples, and I found that it's a tradition where I was staying. There was a, a temple not far away. So I found that it was a tradition that they put food in the morning for the idols. And then it stays there in the evening, and then they keep the doors open. The poor people come and take the food. But then the next day they say the gods ate the food. And that's how they prove to their crowd that God exists. Look, we offer. You remember when a uh, big thing 20, 10 years ago in England, someone put milk in front of Ganesh, you know, one of this, and the milk d seeped. And then they said the that's a proof that God exists, that he drank the milk. That happened like 10, 15 years. It was world news. The people went crazy over this. Someone at home, like the story is not even verifiable, poured milk in front of the, this idol, the elephant and, you know, Ganesh. So, and then um, the milk was seeped in probably through the ceramic. It sucked it or something. Or maybe the cat came and drank from it. But it's, that's not the problem. The issue is, it struck me when I saw that I understood an ayah in the Quran that I never understood it before when I saw that site. Allah in Surah Al-Dhariyat, He said, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا 
ليعبدون I have not created the jinn and the ins except to worship me look what the next ayah is ما أريد منهم من رزق وما أريد أن يطعمون I don't want them to give me رزق nor I want them to feed me إن الله هو الرزاق ذو القوة المتين it is Allah who gives رزق I never understood this ayah until I saw with my own eyes they're giving rizq to their gods and food. Which means this tradition was at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. So Allah, Allah was responding to that tradition. I don't want you to give me rizq. I don't want you to feed me. I'm the one who feeds you. I'm the one who gives you rizq. What kind of a flipped upside down? Who's God and who's servant? Who's the creator and who's the created? So when we talk about Ramadan, we just have one thing we have to sit in our mind. That Ramadan is a very, very special month before fasting. And it's very important that you build the case. And I will tell you towards the end of why it's important to build the case like that. Because it will demystify so many things. So I'm going to dive with you. Let's say what time right now? 10.46. I'm going to try, inshallah, within 15 minutes to finish the specialty of Ramadan. Okay. In the hadith, the Prophet says, أَفْضَلُ أَيَّامِ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ يَوْمُ الْجُمْعَةِ وَأَفْضَلُ الشُّهُورِ شَهْرُ رمضان. The best month is the month of Ramadan. Okay, so that's good. You all have heard this hadith many times. What happens on the first night of Ramadan? Yes. You know it, it's in your head. MashaAllah, wow. The first night of Ramadan, we pray Taraweeh. Very good. There is a hadith you always hear. When the first night of Ramadan comes, this happen and that happens and this happen and that happens. Do you remember hearing that hadith? When the first night of Ramadan comes, this happen and that happen. Yes, sister. When the first night of Ramadan, Allah listens to the heart of... Uh, probably you're bringing another hadith. But... Uh-huh. All... Huh? Okay. So you guys together put the hadith together. All the gates of Jannah are open until no gate is closed. All the gates of hell are closed until no gate is open. And all the leaders of shayateen, and in one hadith, shayateen themselves, this two, one says the leaders, one says the shayateen, are chained. This happens when? First night of Ramadan. I'm going to ask you a question. When the first night of Ramadan has happened, have you started fasting in Ramadan by then? No. Not a single human on planet Earth, not a single Muslim has fasted yet. As a matter of fact, there is a hadith that the Prophet ﷺ says, do not fast before Ramadan by a day or two. Separate Ramadan, like make it special. Special start. Don't, unless you're making up from last Ramadan, or you're doing some regular fasting, like day on, day off, Mondays and Thursdays. يعني, but, لا تسبقوا صوم رمضان بصوم يوم أو يومين. Don't, don't by day or two. So, the first night of Ramadan, not a single Muslim on planet Earth have fasted. Which means, this hadith, when it says, when the first night of Ramadan comes, all the gates of heaven open and all the gates of hell closes, and shayateen, this has nothing to do with the ibad and what they're doing. This has nothing to do with fasting, because no one has fasted. It's purely a gift from Allah to you, because of the month of Ramadan. It's special. طيب. There is a hadith that the Prophet says there is a night in Ramadan in which Allah forgives the believers, all of them. So the Sahaba said, oh, we know Ya Rasulullah, it's Laylatul Qadr. He said, no, it's not. Oh, which Layla? He said, the last night of Ramadan. How come? Rasulullah Sallallahu said, when does the owner, the manager, the business owner pay his workers? Isn't it by the, when they're done doing the job? 
you're done with your job, you get paid. He gave the example of a business owner, like, وَهَلْ يُعْتَلْ أَجِيرُ أَجْرَهُ إِلَّا إِذَا انْقَضَى عَمَلُهُ So the idea here is, the last night of Ramadan is a night of forgiveness for all the believers who put their heart in Ramadan regardless. This is what? The last night of Ramadan. So now we have the first night and the last night. We all hear so many times towards the end of Ramadan that people talk about something. The last something, something. The last something, something. Huh? Last 10 days? The last 10 nights of Ramadan. What are we seeking in the last 10 nights of Ramadan? Huh? What are we seeking in the last 10 nights of Ramadan? Laylatul Qadr. Thank you, Jazakumullah. So there goes number three. Number one, hadith, first night of Ramadan. Number two, hadith, last night of Ramadan. Number three, hadith, last ten nights of Ramadan. Now here is number four, hadith. The Prophet وسلم, says, وَإِنَّ لِلَّهِ عُتَقَاءَ مِنَ النَّارِ In the month of Ramadan, Allah looks at his ibad, picks a group of names. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants them general amnesty, total 100% forgiveness. There is no judgment for them on the Day of Judgment. And Rasulullah sallallahu said, وَذَلِكَ كُلَّ لَيْلَ And that's every night. And the exciting thing, it could be one, it could be you, but you never know. Because Allah will not tell you until the Day of Judgment. So that's what? First night, last night, last ten nights, Obviously, two surahs and so many ayat about Laylatul Qadr and number five, every night. I'm asking you, do we fast in the day or in the night? In the day. It has nothing to do with your fasting. Ramadan is a blessed month by itself, on its own, without you doing or not doing. Do you know why this is important? Why this is very fundamental and important for all believers at different ages and at different states in life and at different gender, why is this very important? Because if you think that the value of Ramadan is in fasting and that's not a Quranic or Hadith case, then if you're not fasting, you lost it. You're gone. You're out of luck. Type. What happens when the woman is on her period? Is that her fault? No. But what happened if a woman just delivered a baby and she's going through 40 days of post-delivery uh, bleeding? She missed fasting. What happened for a woman that is pregnant and cannot fast? What happened to a woman that is breastfeeding? What happened to an old person, man or woman? What happened to a man or woman who's traveling? What happened to a man or woman who became sick in the month of Ramadan? You don't fast, you're out of luck. Ma'assalame, go home, cry, and be sad, and get depressed. And that's what we do. But when you understand that the value of the month of Ramadan is independent of you fasting, then you will always understand, I can always get the total barakah of the month of Ramadan without fasting, if I have an excuse. Obviously, if you don't have an excuse, you're destroying one of the pillars of Islam. Yani it's, it's a kabira. It's not a small matter. Yani let's not make little of any of that. But the idea here is, think with me, Allah Azza wa Jal made the value, the value of the month of Ramadan in Ramadan by itself because in the month of Ramadan, the Quran was revealed. And you did you hear all of these five hadith about night, 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 night? Do you know why all of that? Because one night in Ramadan, the Quran was revealed, it spread the barakah on the whole month. As a matter of fact, it spread the month barakah on the whole year. As a matter of fact, it spread the barakah on, the, on, on all of, of humanity. Here we are, 1400 years later, enjoying that night and what happened in that night. So you have to kind of 
see, you know, the point of the month of Ramadan. Let me add to you something that when I read it, it blew my mind. It's a hadith ba'if, but it's not fabricated. It's weak in its narration. The Prophet sallallahu said, The Torah was revealed on the seventh night of Ramadan. The Injil was revealed on the 21st night of Ramadan. The Zabur Psalms of David was revealed on the 14th night of Ramadan. Suhaf Ibrahim was revealed on the 29th of Ramadan. And the Quran was revealed on the 25th night of Ramadan. What I get from this hadith, it seems that historically from the beginning of creation from Adam till Muhammad, all revelation started on the night of Ramadan. Alayhimu salatu wa salam wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. You understand? Ramadan is like a, it's a big deal. As big as it gets, big deal. Historically, with all the prophets and messengers, the, you know how Jibreel alayhi salam job as pointed by Allah is to what? Jibreel is what's his job? To bring what? Revelation from Allah to the messengers. Done. And that's why huh? when the Prophet وسلم, passed away, خلاص, Jibreel is no, no more coming to planet earth. Except one night a year. Laylatul Qadr. He pays a visit to year to earth, to planet earth. Once a year. That's when you read in Surah Al-Qadr, تَنَزَّلُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَالْرُوحُ فِيهَا بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهِمْ مِنْ كُلِّ أَمْرٍ Who's the Ruh? Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam. That's one of the big deals of every year of Ramadan that Jibreel visits planet Earth only on the night to commemorate the night he came and brought the Quran with him and then took five ayat and gave it to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. اِقْرَأْ بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ you know how you, uh, it's a Western tradition to celebrate your birthday once a year. And the way I see it is every year in the month of Ramadan, we celebrate the birthday of Islam throughout history. And again, just like the Prophet ﷺ celebrated his birthday by fasting, we celebrate the birthday of Islam by fasting, not for one day, but for one month. So if someone tells you, what is Ramadan? Your friend says, oh, what is Ramadan? Oh, that's when the whole story started, man. <laughs> that's like our birthday, like the birthday of my faith and the birthday of every faith, of every prophet, of every messenger. It seems Ramadan has been appointed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just like Jibreel was appointed. It's a, it's a special month. You know, Allah chooses amongst places and declares it holy. Mecca, Medina, and Masjid al-Aqsa. That's Allah's business. Allah chooses amongst people and declares them special, the prophets and the messengers. Allah picks amongst times, times, certain times, and Allah calls them special. The time of day of Jum'ah, ah, the last one third of the night, the month of Ramadan, Mondays and Thursdays. It's Allah's business what Allah calls holy and special and what Allah doesn't. We just learn that. We don't determine that, we just learn that so this is something very very important so fascinating the month of ramadan is special especially the nights and look how much the night is emphasized in surah al-dukhan allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says inna anzalnahu fi abat laylat al-qadr not inna anzalnahu fi laylat al-qadr inna anzalnahu fi laylatin mubaraka inna kunna munzirin fiha yufraqu kullu amrin hakim amran min indina so the idea is in this night is Mubarakah. Okay. So Surah Al-Qadr. Inna anzalnahu fi wa ma adraka ma laylatul qadri khair min al-fish. Yani short surah <laughs> and the word laylatul qadr is two, three times in a short surah. Like how much more emphasis do you want? <laughs> the whole thing is five ayat. Three ayat of the five ayat, Laylatul Qadr, Laylatul Qadr, Laylatul Qadr. Three out of five. Fascinating. The first revelation to Prophet Muhammad. By the way, Surah Al-Qadr in Al-Mushaf al-Sharif right after Al-Alaq. 
اقرأ باسم ربك الذي خلق then it's like what was first revealed the first five ayat when it was revealed in Laylatul Qadr two surahs back to back what and where and when back to back the first of revelation to the Prophet Sallallahu how many ayat اقرأ باسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم سورة القدر also five ayat okay you in the corner what's her name your sister Tahseen how many para is in the Quran Juzu 30 there is 30 words in Surah إن أنزلناه في ليلة القدر طيب you, what's your name? The one behind you, the young girl there. Yes. Huh? Huh? What's your name? What's your name? Yeah, you. Hafsa? How old are you, Hafsa? Ten? Do you know how many surahs are there in the Quran? You can tell her. 114. Isn't it mind blowing that in Surah Inna Anzalnahu Fi Laylatul Qadr there is exactly 114 letters? It's like the whole Quran coded in this Surah. Tayyip. Layla. Layla. How many, how many letters in the word Layla? Layla. Yal. What's your name? I can't hear you. Ayana? MashaAllah. How many letters? Layla. Count with me. Uh huh. How many? Ha. Tamar buta. So how many? So lam. Ya. Lam. Ta. How many? طيب القدر it's getting harder يلا معلش be patient القدر do you know Arabic letters how many letters القدر how many letters in the word القدر تمام ألف لام قا دا را طيب ليلى is four القدر is four plus five ها huh? four plus five طيب إن أنزلناه في ليلة القدر وما أدراك ما ليلة القدر ليلة القدر خير من الألف شهر nine times three twenty seven إنا أنزلناه في ليلة القدر وما أدراك ما ليلة القدر ليلة القدر خير من ألف شهر تنزل الملائكة والروح فيها بإذن ربهم من كل أمر سلام هي حتى مطلع الفجر peaceful it is هي it means it is because in Arabic we don't have it it's either masculine or feminine so the Arabs decided that ليلة is feminine and نهار is masculine and they decided that the sun is feminine and the moon is masculine. So it does, has nothing to do which one is bigger, which one is smaller, whatever they feel. He is shamsu wa huwa al qamar. We don't have it in Arabic. So salamun hiya hatta matla al fajr. The word hiya in the sequence of the 30 words is word number 27. Again. <laughs> this is what we call hints. We, don't, we can't walk out and say, see. This is, okay, uh, numerical tafsir of the Qur'an is what we call is used for hints, like for just, we, we say it and say, wow, Allahu A'lam, and we move on. But we don't build iman and aqidah and we start fighting with each other because of numerical tafsir of the Qur'an. That stuff can take a person to hell. Why am I saying that? Rashad Khalifa is an Egyptian person who started as a scholar and got so much into the numerical and got so much into number 19 
and found every letter in the Quran multiplication of number 19 and every letter in every surah is multiplication of number 19 and based on that he removed, reprinted the Mus'haf and removed two ayat from Al-Quran Al-Kareem because they did not match number 19. This is crazy. So don't go there. Right? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, 19 letters. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Alayha 19. And this guy went crazy with this number. وخلاص, now he's removing ayat from the Quran. And he started a, a movement. His student, who was a very devoted student, realized that this man is very dangerous. And it was 1982 that actually his student killed him here in the United States, unfortunately. And then what happened, his other students kept on going. And they're very large in numbers. I mean, they're called submitters. Teach your children not to go with people who call themselves submitters because if you even say Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they get so angry that you said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yeah, I, you know, the guy became so jealous of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, no, 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 I'll fix the Quran and you don't say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to him. Say it to me, like praise me. Yeah, and he, you became jealous of the Prophet. 1400 years later, man, you, go home, man. Go to hell, actually. <laughs> Anyway, just so that you don't go crazy with the numerical tafsir of the Quran because people will make you lose your iman with this numerical. And we don't have in the Quran and Sunnah that we do numerical tafsir. We just, we call, this is, uh, uh, you know, hints. Like, you know, we say, we look at it, we say, subhanallah. Allah created the whole world based on the world laws of physics and math and chemistry and biology. So this is not strange to Allah Azza wa Jal to have these numerical uh, miracles in the Quran but we leave it like that so now are you convinced the month of Ramadan is special by itself on its own without fasting and the whole action is happening when you are not fasting <laughs> it's all happening at night when do we pray Taraweeh after Asr La. after Isha and what do we do in Salat Taraweeh we read the Quran from beginning to end and when do we do it at night when the Quran was revealed at night that's why we don't make taraweeh in the day. Because the Quran was revealed at night. The Quran was revealed before Fajr on Monday. Before Fajr on Monday. So we prayed and that's why the, and in the last third of the night. And that's why we make, in a normal day, we try to make tahajjud before Fajr, like half an hour, one hour. And in the month of Ramadan, we try to pray taraweeh after Aisha and tahajjud before Fajr, commemorating the whole story of the Quran. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this month of Ramadan that is special why is it special? Because I revealed the Quran in it. So we have to answer what is the Quran? Right? So do we have to go and sweat it? No. Allah gave you a summary of what is in the Quran in the very same ayah, ayah number 185 in Surah Al-Baqarah. So in Surah Al-Baqarah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنِ So the month of Ramadan defined, the month in which the Quran was revealed. That's how powerful is the Quran. It made the whole month, the whole year, thousands of years, the whole humanity change. But then Allah Azza wa Jal says, this Quran, He gave you three definitions. هُدًا لِلنَّاسِ وَبَيِّنَاتٍ مِنَ الْهُدَى وَالْفُرْقَانِ Three. Put them in your head, lock it, and focus on Ramadan on these three. هُدًا لِلنَّاسِ Guidance to mankind. And this is very interesting. In the Quran, when Allah Azza wa Jal, if you trace the Quran and you follow the work of the people who do ilm al-tafsir, they say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he says the word an-nas in the Quran, it's half of the time in the Quran, it's referring to the non-Muslims. And the other half, it refers to all mankind, including Muslims. وَأَذَانٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ إِلَى النَّاسِ يَوْمَ الْحَجِّ الْأَكْبَرِ أَنَّ اللَّهَ بَرِيءٌ مِّنَ الْمُسْرِكِينَ مِّنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ وَرَسُولُهُ وَأَذَانٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ It's in Surah Bara'a, right? And a declaration from Allah um, to mankind
um, I want to just get you the exact number of the ayah. That's all what I'm doing here. It's ayah number three in Surah at tawbah وَأَذَانٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ إِلَى النَّاسِ يَوْمِ الْحَجِّ الْأَكْبَرِ يَوْمَ الْحَجِّ الْأَكْبَرِ And a declaration from Allah and His Messenger to Anas on the day of Al-Hajj Al-Akbar. The word Anas here means the non-Muslims. When Allah Azza wa Jal says, Hudan lin nasi, number one item. This is very important for you and I to understand because Allah made us live in America, God knows, 1400 years later, in a continent that people didn't even know that it exists, except Muslims knew. But the idea here is, uh, you know, we are living here and we're living among, in a non Muslim society. This Hudan lin nasi should make you walk with your head high. Not low, don't be shy, don't be hiding, don't, don't think what you have is irrelevant to the others because they're not Muslims. You don't force it on them, they're not required to follow it, but it is a solution that will work for everyone. So if a Muslim does not drink alcohol, would that benefit him or not? Does not drink alcohol, would that benefit him or not? Yes. Taib, if a non-Muslim does not drink alcohol, would that benefit him or not? Who then lin nasi? If a Muslim is kind and gentle to his parents, would that make him feel good and great or not? Tab, if a non-Muslim, same. Tab. If a Muslim does not make himself drown in riba debt, would that help him or not? Tab, if a non-Muslim, who then lin nasi? We don't have only solutions for Muslims. Islam is for everyone. So Allah Azza wa Jal says, who then lin nasi? Whether the word an nas here, meaning, the kafirin, or it means entire humanity, this Quran is for everyone. So, when you talk to your friends, share solutions. Yani it's very fascinating, like when you look at the uh, Jewish community, they don't want you to convert. They tell you you can't even convert. But they will share with you solutions. They will bring a rabbi on the view program in the morning, or Saturday morning live, or Sunday morning live, and they say, so what is the Jewish point of view about this? Oh, this and it. oh, wow, this is really could be a helpful up. Uh, but you can't be a Jew, remember that. You have to be born a Jew. You can be a Muslim. All day long, all year long, you can be a Muslim. But the mentality has to shift. That this is not only for Muslims, this is, not, this is for everyone. Right? This is for everyone. Dressing modestly, for everyone, for men and women, it will always help. It's a messaging, you know, when you dress modestly. Then when you're walking down the street, hey, I'm not here an object of pleasure. I'm not here to trying to turn heads and attract people because I don't want that. You know, okay, so I turned the heads and I attracted people that I don't know. And that's the end of the story. So what am I, an, an object of attraction, an object of pleasure, just walking around to attract the people that I know and that I don't know? So that's why, you know, it, when you dress modestly, it's a messaging. For Muslim, you're Muslim, you're not Muslim, it's the same. So that's why, subhanAllah, uh, I know actually of a sister. She took shahada like a year ago. And the sister, mashallah, is very pretty. She's so sick and tired of people looking at her. She knows, like, you know, when someone is bothered that they're pretty, because Allah created, she has a very strong of, uh, sense of m m uh, modesty since she was born. So, do you know how she became Muslim? She got to know Muslim sisters and she saw that they were wearing hijab and she, and she looked how people look at them. She was an observant. And some of these Muslim sisters are also pretty and she saw that people don't look at them the same way. So she started wearing hijab before knowing anything about Islam. <laughs> Just to Stop looking at me. Imagine what's a dream and a wish of what any average man or woman to be attractive and handsome in this. Like, halas, this girl is like, okay, it's like, I'm sick and tired of this attention. Leave me alone. She started wearing hijab. She loved it. Then she started. She used an Islamic solution that worked for her. <laughs> Very interesting story. You live and see, as they say. I was like, subhanallah, this is crazy, right? right? 
سبحان الله سو هو دن للناسي جنرال جايدنس اولسو جنرال جايدنس ات سيتس ذا جولز ذا بيربس يو هاف ا جول بيتوين يو اند الله عباده اند يو هاف ا بيربس بيتوين يو اند الله كرييشن خلافه سو يو ار عبد اند خليفه every khalifa means vicegerent representative agent you run planet earth don't destroy this planet allah put you in charge of yourself of humanity and of the planet you are khalifa right so it sets the goals huh then here it says general guidance there's items that we call halal and there are categories of halal the items we call haram and there's categories of haram we don't do haram because it's harmful and filthy We do halal because it's honorable and good, but with halal, we use moderation, with general guidance. You know, I just tell people, because people understand, you know, it was actually Michael Jordan, the first one who said, just do it, and then uh, Nike took it from him, right? And they paid him millions for that. So, if it is fard, just do it. If it's haram, just don't do it. And if it is halal, just don't, overdo it there's one principle with halal most people think halal has no principles the one principle for haram don't do it the one principle for fard you have to do it the one principle for mubah and halal don't overdo it so for example in the quran allah will surprise you in the quran as as far as i know let me see is it four times or six times i forgot i'll tell you right now Seven times. Seven times. Seven times in the Quran, Allah tells you, eat. Command. Oh, you love that command. <laughs> eat and drink. Not a single holy book on this planet that has a command, eat and drink. And still people have a problem with Islam. It's telling them, eat and drink. And people love eating and drinking. And people have a problem with the Quran. I mean, what's your problem, man? It's telling you, eat and drink, but then, وَلَا تُسْرِفُوا do, But don't overdo it. In Allah, لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُسْرِفِينَ Allah does not love those who overdo it. I remember this. SubhanAllah, when you mix um, Islamic civilization with Western civilization. I flew to Malaysia, I think that was 2010, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, to participate in giving a speech about the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu and all of that. I got so hungry, I did not like the food on the plane uh, anyway. So I arrived to the hotel, it was night. I am did hungry, I was so tired, I just went to sleep. I woke up, like for all intents and purposes, I haven't eaten for two days now. And I go down and it is the biggest, most lavish, breakfast like i've never seen so like it has an indian breakfast an arab breakfast a malay breakfast a western breakfast all in one i kid you not as big as this room so i am i will eat today i am hungry right so i go and pick up the plate you know the first thing in the buffet is the plate and i look up and they have written the ayah وَكُلُوا وَاشْرَبُوا وَلَا تُسْرِفُوا Oh my God. I'm like, I've never understood that ayah like that today, like that day. I mean, I was like, really? Did you have to put that there? <laughs> right? like, you know? And it just, uh, it just like, a, I said, oh my God, I have to change my intention. Like, I wanted to do some damage today, right? But, وَكُلُوا وَاشْرَبُوا وَلَا تُسْرِفُوا It was very beautiful. Uh, subhanallah so you know you can you can have both worlds you know you can have thing and you can bring the Quran into it so وَكُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا so if it's halal don't overdo it if it's haram don't do it if it's fard just do it very simple so it's called هُدًا لِلنَّاسِ طيب next statement وَبَيِّنَاتٍ مِنَ الْهُدَى and detailed guidance So there is so much focus that the Qur'an is simply Huda. What is Huda? You understand it today probably better than people in the old times. What do you use your GPS for? Guidance. And what does it do? Turn by turn, it gives you direction. 
what is the Quran turn by turn GPS طيب, if you say to the GPS I want to go back when I came to here there was an accident on the way it delayed us 10-15 minutes anyway so if you tell the GPS I want to go there it will take you to the shortest distance between here and there طيب, if it tells you turn left and you go stubborn with it and you turn right Are you okay? Like being stubborn with who? With yourself? Like, no, I don't want to make a. So then it says, okay, we will reroute you. So now turn left. So then you turn right. Like, do you want to go there or you don't want to go there? The GPS doesn't care. Like, are you okay? Like, what do you want? No, I'm not going right. I'm going left. Suit yourself. <laughs> like, what, what, what's the problem? You want to reach there and you want the short distance. Literally, what that's what, especially us Muslims, because non Muslims don't know what is in the Quran and they're not asked to know the details of Sharia. Literally, Allah says, Turn right. No, I want to turn left. So Allah says in the Quran, Man fa Whosoever is guided, he's only guided for himself. And whosoever chooses to go the wrong way, Literally, the word balal in Arabic before the coming of Islam meant someone went out in the desert in a certain direction, lost his way. That's what balal means. Balin means someone. Group of people went, want to go to this next village, they got lost on the way. But do you know why this word is very powerful? Because balal in the Arabian language, in the Arabian context, in the desert means death. You don't know how much this word Balin bothered people in Mecca. Because they're like, why are you saying we're Balin? Meaning, we're going straight to our death. Because what happens when you lose your way in the desert? You're dead. You're dead. Dehydration is going to kill you. So when you say, غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين, Oh, when, when they found out Rasulullah calls them Balin, it rubbed them so hard. They, they came and attacked the Prophet ﷺ just because of the word Balin. So, what is the Quran? Hudan lin nasi wa bayinatin min al huda. As if there is two parentheses. Huda, huda. Hudan lin nasi wa bayinatin min al huda wal furqan. Detailed guidance. Pray. Pray. Okay, how do I pray? You go to one church, everybody's sitting down, silent, the priest is talking. You go to the next church, they're all reading together hymns you go to the next church there is a band you go to the next church everyone is dancing but what are you doing praying 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 why because there's no details they took the details away it was there it was there in the bible it says subhanallah if you uh, the the scene when they came for isa alayhi salam they said isa was in the state of sujood and he made a dua ya allah if it is your will that i go through this test and it is your will that I drink from this cup, I will drink from this cup. But if it's your will that you can spare me to drink from this cup, please, Ya Allah, spare me. This is in the Bible. The last dua of Isa alayhi salam before crucifixion, and Allah didn't answer his dua in the Bible. And he made him go drink the cup. For us Muslims, he made that dua, and it says, and Jesus was onto his face, onto the ground, state of sujood. Fascinating. In the Bible, and Abraham went and washed his hands and feet and fell into his face to the ground for God. And Moses went and washed his hands and face and feet and fell onto his face to the ground. And David went and washed his hands and feet and, de and fell onto his face to the ground. The same deen that Allah revealed for us, revealed for everyone, including, 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 fasting. Jazakallah khair. O you who believe fasting has been made mandatory on you like it was mandatory upon those who come before you, who came before you. Why? Because Allah knows you're going to look at our Muslim youth and children or even adults. Why is Islam the hardest religion? Look, why are we the only one fasting? How come the Jews and Christians don't fast? Allah said it was written upon them. In the ayah that talks about fasting, Allah said it was written upon them. 
so that you don't say why only me so the idea here Allah said hudan lin nas wa bayinat details how to give zakah details how to perform hajj details how to fast details how to divide the inheritance details what are the rights of the husband and the rights of the wife basic duties and rights details what is the right of the worker versus the business owner details economical details social details political details spiritual religious practices details you're not left to figure out things and I will show you how fasting is one of the biggest details in the Quran طيب. very good when you look at that Allah Azza wa Jal says the Quran is what hudan lin nasi wa bayinatin minal yani turn by turn GPS you don't want to listen you're misleading yourself you said you want to go to Jannah yes or no yes you said you want Allah to be with you in every endeavor in life yes or no yes okay here is turn by turn no I don't want to okay suit yourself you're only working against yourself man like you're not fighting God you're fighting yourself وَمَا أَنْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ بِوَكِيلٍ You're not going to force them to do this, Muhammad. Leave them alone. They don't want to follow it. That's their choice. مَنْ اِهْتَدَى فَإِنَّمَا يَهْتَدِي So, third word, والفرقان. What is فرقان? Ha! Huh. May Allah bless you. Differentiation and a divide, a clear cut, a criterion between right and Good and halal and truth and falsehood. And that goes right in the face of Western academia. What's the hallmark of Western academia? Confusion. Look, look what's happening right now. The more the academia goes up, the more the confusion goes up. Oh, there is no God. Be confused about God. Is there God? No, we're confused. Oh, I'm agnostic. I'm not sure there is God. Okay. Is there a religion? No, you follow whatever religion yourself. Doubt your religion. Okay. They even want you to doubt yourself. Like every morning you have to look, am I a man or a woman? Like, the heck is going on, man? Like every day you have to check yourself. And every day you have to like, oh, like, so what is this? Gender confusion, uh, uh, life confusion, um, yani, and, and they sell stuff to the public so that the one who's in charge stays in charge and the one who's not in charge stays as a follower. So for example, they tell you, do whatever you like. Do whatever makes you feel happy. It makes me feel happy to smack you on the face. Shall I do it? It made happy. It made Hitler so happy to kill people. Six million minorities and six million Jews, 12 million. It made Joseph Stalin so happy, he killed 19 million. It made Mao Zedong, the man who killed the most number of people on planet Earth after Genghis Khan, 80 million. More than the First World War and Second World War combined together. At 70 million people died in First World War, Second World War. Between his wars and policies, 80 million Chinese died because of Mao Zedong. The only one who killed before him was half of the number, 45 million people, Genghis Khan with his children, which mounted to 12% of the world population at that time. It made him feel so good. He felt so good, he used to go to sleep very happy. Mm, do whatever makes you happy? Sure. Are you sure you want me to do whatever makes me happy? Look how it just sounds good. It just sounds good, right? Look how they lure our children. Look, look, look at the packaging, messaging. Why shall you be judged by the one whom you love? Oh, that's true. Why shall you be judged? Okay. First of all, who said that in any logic or in any religion, you shall be judged by the one whom you love? But when in the world did you change the word love 
from an emotion, the most honorable emotion a human can give anyone else, and between physical relationship. Since when the physical pleasure has been called love? Look, but they don't make you feel. Why shall you be judged by the one whom you love? You shall not be judged by the one whom you love. I love my mom. I love my dad. I love my brothers. I love my sisters. I love my cousins. I love my nephews. I love my nieces. I love my aunts. I love my uncles. I love my grandparents. I love my grandchildren. No. Of course you shall not be loved. But who said that the word love has anything to do with physical relationship between two people? But look how they package it. Why? To confuse you so that you can have no furqan in your life. No furqan, no criteria, no divider between right and wrong, good and bad. And where are you going to go with it? Where are you going to go with this? Oh, if two people love one another and they have the consent, they can have a relationship. So then why are you against incest? I don't want to go in details. We have younger people in the crowd. The adults, you need to know these arguments. Then why are you against incest? So that's why وَبَيْنَاتِ مِنَ الْهُدَى وَالْفُرْقَانِ Right? Uh, and, but this is the Western Academia. Do you know something fascinating about the Western Academia? Do you know how much philosophy, the philosophy department, generates for any given American university? Income, generates income. Zero. Yet, it's as financed or more financed than every other department that generates income for the university. Pick up UC Berkeley, Stanford. Philosophy department gets allocated as much. Why? Because without philosophy, you cannot control the crowds. How much invention did philosophy give us? Zero. How much research and income does it bring to? Zero. But they give it as much money because with it, they control the minds of that. Because God forbid some of these students are going to wake up one day and say, oh, there is a God. Oh, no, no, no. We need your philosophy. Philosophy 101. What's the highlights of philosophy 101? Everything is questioned and we question everything except your intelligence. That's philosophy 101. Actually, the first thing that philosophers agree upon is that the most questionable thing is human logic. Why? Because it changes based on time and it changes based on situations. So if it is in my maslaha to be corrupt, mm, if I don't have a strong iman, I'll be corrupt. If it's in mas my maslaha to grow a beard and be a sheikh and become maulana, I'll become a sheikh and become maulana. The human logic is the most flawed thing ever. The human logic and the human intellect it changes by time, by place, by interest. And that's why we need a dean that puts a check on your logic so that you don't end up being corrupt. So, do you understand? So, my dear brothers and sisters, we want to come up with one fa'ida, one benefit from this. Please, brothers and sisters, month of Ramadan is not a month just like you go and find the most beautiful Qari voice and you pray for and you're so much bent on finishing the Quran from beginning to end. By the way, by the way, 99% of Muslims don't know that finishing reading the Quran every month is the minimum required from a Muslim. Recommended but not required. It's not fard. The Prophet ﷺ did not make it fard, but when the Sahaba asked him, one Sahabi said, I want to read it in one if the Quran, I'm going to read it once a day. He said, don't do that. He said, once every day, three days. He said, he said once a week. He said, do not go past once a month. Right? So reading the Quran once a month is not a big deal. <laughs> to us now it's a big deal because we don't read Quran. So in Ramadan it becomes a big deal. But let me just break the ice for you. It's not a big deal. That's what you do year around. So then in Ramadan... What you want, you want the Qur'an to be these three things for you. Action, action, action. Hudan lil-nasi, wa bayyinati min al-huda, wal-furqan. 
My dear brothers and sisters, if every time you come to the masjid, you listen to the qari, you cry, you're so happy, oh my God, you're spiritually high, you leave the house, you go to your home, and you exactly do the opposite of what Allah asks you to do. You are a husband, Allah is asking you to be kind to your wife, you are a dictator. You are a wife, Allah is asking you to be honorable to your husband, you make his life hell. Cry all that you want in the masjid. Nobody's crying with you. We come to the masjid, we cry, Ramadan, oh my God, da da da. Then we leave, then we lie and cheat and steal and corrupt. How many years I lived in a Muslim country in the Arabian Peninsula for five years. I hated, like, I started developing a resentment against people because I saw them, how they go to the masjid. The whole masjid is crying. I'm telling you, men crying like as if a group of women lost their children. Like you will say, oh my God, this is Masjid al-Salihin. You meet them after Salat al-Taraweeh, racism. They will not even talk to you if you're not from their race. Like extreme racism. Extreme colorism within the same race. What are you doing? Man, go cry on yourself. You should cry. You should cry on how pathetic you are. Spare me your cry in the month of Ramadan. What are you doing? We're not Hindus. I'm sorry, but we're not Hindus. Our deen is not built on singing poem and then feeling spiritual and then here we are done. No. Quran was not meant to be sung and not practiced. You don't do a favor to yourself, to Islam, to Allah, to any to humanity by crying when you hear the Quran. No. You should cry, but with that, you should your call, your target is what? Is that you uh, basically get you practice, practice, practice. I'm gonna change this Ramadan. I'm gonna change my practice. I'm gonna change my practice. You know what? By Allah, and I will meet Allah with this on the day of judgment. If you pick one ayah in the Quran, something that you hate to do. I don't know, every one of us hates something different. You pick something that you hate to do, and you're struggling with in your life, with Islam, and you pick Ramadan and you keep on just applying that ayah, applying that one thing in the Quran, is better for you than reading the Quran 10 times, make khatim every three days, and you're not applying anything. Hudan Linasi wa bayinatin. Explain detailed, clear guidance, mean al huda, turn by turn GPS, wal furqan clarity. Right? This is yani, yani, yani. The closest you can become to angels is in Ramadan. Why? Angels don't eat, don't drink, don't sleep, don't mate. That's what you do in Ramadan. Can you please just do a good job, just in Ramadan at least, to start? That's why it's a boot camp, training camp, a booster. So what you need is a plan of action in Ramadan. This whole thing, I'm just like, oh my God, I feel so bad I didn't read the Quran from beginning to end. Oh my God, I did not go to the masjid and pray tarweeh. Oh my God. Nobody's talking about, oh my God, I did not practice. Oh my God, I did not change this Ramadan. Oh my God, I know there is one thing about me that... I, and I did not work on it. Oh my God, I did not do more. Like action, action, action. That's what Ramadan is about. So second topic is done. I'm summarizing to you what I explained in eight hours. I'm trying to do it in two hours. It's not even two hours. It's an hour and a half. Okay. So first module, the month of Ramadan. I have it on... 200 slides here. If I show it to you, you're gonna like freak out. So I'm doing it from my head. So number one, the Ramadan. You got Ramadan? Number two, the Quran. Right. How many names in the Quran about the Quran? You've all heard about the 99 names of Allah. You heard about the, the names of the Prophet Wasallam. If Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, please, please give me the honor of finishing this book, I'm writing a book about the names of the Quran in the Quran. 60 names of the Quran in the Quran. That will blow your mind. Inshallah. 
القرآن العظيم القرآن الكريم القرآن المجيد بصائر للناس حبل الله العروة الوثقى القرآن العزيز الق... يعني in the Quran there's so many this كلام الله أحسن الحديث you start you don't finish it's beautiful الفرقان الذكر إنا نحن نزلنا الذكر وإنا له لحافظون التنزيل ال... يعني it's a long it's a beautiful beautiful endeavor uh, third module is Allah عز وجل said now, if you get point number one and you get point number two, now you're qualified to get point number three. That's not me talking, that's the Quran. Shahru Ramadan, الذي أنزل فيه القرآن. You got that? Okay. Yes, Ya Allah. طيب. This Quran is hudan lin nasi wa bayinatim min al huda wal furqan. Do you get that? Do you get the build up? Do you see how the Quran builds the case? Month of Ramadan is special. Because the Quran was revealed in it and we mentioned all the other ahadith. Because especially because the Quran and then the definitions of the Quran in the Quran. Now Allah says if you get these two points. فَمَنْ شَهِدَ So whosoever witnesses the month. فَلْيَصُمْهَ Now fasting comes. Now you are qualified to fast in the month of Ramadan. Because you get point number one and you get point number two. شَهْرُ Ramadan. What about it, Ya Allah, الذي أنزل فيه القرآن? Okay, so what is the Quran, Ya Allah, to me? What should it be? هُدًا لِلنَّاسِ وَبَيِّنَاتٍ مِنَ الْهُدَى وَالْفُرْقَانِ Okay, okay, okay. So, what do I do? فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَصُمْهَ Let him fast. طيب. Oh my God. So there's two questions now. Question number one. What is fasting? Question number two. Why fasting? And interestingly, both questions are answered in these few ayat. 183, 184, 185, 186 is about dua, and 187. These are the number of ayat in Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah Azza wa Jal answers the question of what is fasting, not eating, not drinking, and no relationship between a husband and wife. Why fasting? Why? Give me an answer from the floor. Why do we fast? And we are only we only ask why when Allah tells us why. So it becomes a legitimate question because He told you why. Why do you fast? Who knows? Yes. How do you know that? Huh? Very simply, Ayu Aladina Amanu, Kutiba Alikum Siyamu. Yama Kutiba Ala Ladina Min Kablikum why? La Allah kum tatakun so that you may gain taqwa. So, do you know how <laughs> how much this is not clear in the mind of Muslims? Okay. What is the most common answer when non-Muslims ask Muslims, Hey guys, why do you fast? What's the answer? So that we can feel with the poor people. Oh my God, how much I don't like that answer. I'm asking, I'm asking. Do poor people break their fast like rich people? Do you know how hypocritical to say I'm fasting to feel with the poor people then you break your fast like a rich person? You no, know, you're not. You're not fasting to... No. So stop saying that. Shh. Stop saying that. Spare yourself the hypocrisy. We don't fast so that we can feel with the poor people. No, that's not why. Allah said you fast so that you can gain taqwa. Part of taqwa is giving sagar and sadaqah. But not the whole thing. Part of taqwa is giving sagar and sadaqah. And zakah and sadaqah, zakah is obligatory on you and sadaqah is extra. So, okay. So now, fasting. We do not eat, we do not drink, we do not. Isn't it interesting that fasting draws a line here? Anything under the line is denied. Anything above the line is welcome. What's above the line? Your heart, your mind, your soul. What's under the line? Your stomach, your sexual desire, your private parts. In Ramadan, Allah draws the line and says, from here and down, we're going to neglect it. We're going to deny it during the days of Ramadan. I need you to think about from here and up. 
we need to draw the line. <laughs> That's exactly what we do when we fast. We draw the line. We want the Quran in your mind. We want the Quran in your heart. We want the Quran in your actions. We don't want you to focus on the bottom part. So no eating, no drinking. And no. But this is fascinating because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I want you to fast so that you can gain taqwa. Okay. So what's the relationship between taqwa and fasting? In order to understand the relationship between taqwa and fasting, we need to explain the meaning of the word taqwa. Taqwa is translated fear of God, God-fearing, mindfulness. Okay, so let's go for the linguistic meaning and then build the case on it. Taqwa means, believe it or not, it means avoidance, to avoid. To put a shield between you and something, to avoid it. That's what taqwa means. Proof, Surah Al-Baqarah. Uh, Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ مِمَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِنْ مِثْلِي ثُمَّ ادْعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ وَادْعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِئٍ قِينٍ فَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا وَلَنْ تَفْعَلُوا فَاتَّقُوا النَّارِ الَّتِي وَقُودُهَا النَّاسُ وَالْحِجَارَةُ أُعِدَّتْ لِلْكَافِرِينَ You are in doubt of this Quran? Bring one surah like it. If you cannot bring one surah and you will not be able to bring one surah, then avoid hell that was prepared for the kafirin. Ya ayuha ladheena amanu, O you who believe, Qu anfusakum. Save yourself, put yourself, wa ahlikum and your families, nara wa quuduha al-nasu wa al-hijara. A hellfire that is lit by molten rocks and human beings, volcanoes and human beings. That's what's lighting the fuel of hellfire. Ya ayuha ladheena amanu, Qu anfusakum. Save yourself, shield yourself and your what? And your families. That's why we, mashallah, you're bringing your children to the masjid. That's very beautiful. May Allah bless you. وَأَهْلِيكُمْ نَارًا وَقُودُهَا النَّاسُ وَالْحِجَارَةِ طَيِّبْ How in the world Allah said, اِتَّقُوا النَّارِ And Allah says in the Quran, اِتَّقُوا اللَّهِ Avoid Allah? No. If you use your Arabic ears, just like you use your English ears, like your Urdu ears, in every language, there is expressions in which there is a word dropped in the middle. The listener understands it without the speakers having to say it. Taib. I am on the first, second floor in my building. And I am looking out of the window, uh, checking out the street. My friend is in the bottom, on the street. He can see the building, he can see the second floor and the third floor. On the third floor, my neighbor is about to dump his garbage from the window down onto the street. Or pour a bucket of water. What are you going to scream at me? What's the most common English phrase for that? Watch out! Thank you. Jazakallah. If I apply his advice literally, watch out! I'm going to stick my head out and the thing is going to fall into my head. But what do I do? I pull in. I use the opposite meaning of the word. This is in every language. I'm very sure if you search in your language, you will find... Two words that you say them and you mean the opposite. And there's so many examples like this in the English language. Ittaqillah, it means, there's a word dropped in the middle. Avoid and put a shield between you and Allah's punishment. You and Allah's wrath. You and Allah's striking at you. Avoid Avoid Allah here means avoid, avoiding Allah, meaning run to Allah, meaning be mindful of Allah. But you have to understand the linguistics first. Ittaqillah means avoid Allah striking at you. Example, Allah told Iblis, make sujood to Adam. Iblis said, no, I'm not making sujood. Allah said to the angels, Iblis was there. He said, why didn't you make sujood? You are with them. Everyone made sujood. Why not you? He said, I am better than him. You created me from fire. You created him from clay. Allah gave him a chance to make tawbah. Shaitan became full, full of himself. Argued with Allah. Said no to Allah. And kept on saying no to Allah. 
what Allah did. Allah قال فخرج منها فإنك رجيم. Rajim means casted away, pushed out of Allah's mercy. What happened? Iblis, by continuously insisting and insisting and insisting and arguing with Allah, he earned Allah's what? Wrath and curse. Adam, don't eat from the tree. He ate from the tree, him and his wife. Why did you eat from the tree? Oh, sorry, Ya Allah. We didn't mean, we forgot. Oh, please Allah. If you don't forgive us and have your mercy upon us, we will be amongst the losers. Allah forgave them, problem solved, everything is done. Do you understand? So you have two options. Bringing Allah's wrath upon you, like Iblis, or avoiding Allah's wrath and bringing Allah's mercy and blessings upon you, like Adam salam. Which one? Do you want to follow your father or the enemy of your father? Our father Adam salam, solved the problem for us. So the idea here is, taqwa is to avoid Allah's wrath. طيب. In order to avoid Allah's wrath, there is an ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah 177. Allah explains what is taqwa. You will find by the time that you are done reading the ayah that in taqwa is all the pillars of Iman. In taqwa, all the pillars of Islam. In taqwa, good character and fulfilling your promise. In taqwa, patience and perseverance. In taqwa, staying away from haram. Five elements in taqwa. Imaniyat, ibadat, adab and akhlaq, sharia, following the sharia, staying away from haram, you follow the sharia, and then sabr and persistence and being strong believer your whole life. In this ayah, ليس البر أن تولوا وجوهكم قبل المشرق والمغرب ولكن البر من آمن بالله. And then it goes, وَأَقَامَ الصَّلَاةَ وَأَتَى الزَّكَاءَ So it's, it lists the pillars of Iman. Then, وَالْمُوفُونَ بِعَهْدِهِمْ إِذَا عَاهَدُوا And those who fulfill their promise when they give a promise, they have a good character, noble character. They don't lie, they don't cheat, they don't break their promise. Character. وَالصَّابِرِينَ فِي الْبَأْسَاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ وَحِينَ الْبَأْسِ And those who have sabr, perseverance and consistency and persistency in following their deen when there is hardship, when there is harmful times, hardship times, and at the time of the battle. They don't run away. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, those are al-muttaqeen. So the word taqwa, you tuck in all the pillars of Islam. Everything about Islam, you tuck it in taqwa if, if it's combined with practice. So when Allah keeps on saying, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ When you have the iman and the amal, iman plus amal equals taqwa. How does fasting teach us taqwa? Look how fasting teaches the taqwa. The biggest thing that you need to avoid Allah's wrath, Allah told Adam, don't eat from the tree. He ate from the tree. طيب. Half of the teachings of our deen is do not do this. طيب. Do not do what? Do not do haram. So how do we train you on not doing haram? We come to you and we say, we're going to give you a training in which you are not going to do halal. Is water halal or haram? Halal. In the days of Ramadan, haram. If you have no excuse in breaking your fast, water is halal. In the days of Ramadan, so I'm asking you, if you can say no to water, can't you say no to alcohol? Very easy. Training, detailed guidance. Type. Bread is halal or haram? In the days of Ramadan, if you say no to bread, you cannot say no to pork. Husband and wife married in with a sheikh in the masjid in front of a thousand witness. Halal or haram? Halal. In the days of Ramadan, haram. If you can say no to your wife or to your husband, you cannot say no to a boyfriend and a girlfriend and all of the zina outside in the world? Yes, you can. It's fascinating what Ramadan does to us. It's a crash course and a training in what? In staying away from haram. Then on the top of that, 
more prayer. What are you talking? You're complaining about five daily prayers. Try praying 21 rak'ah. <laughs> it's a training. You're complaining about reading little bit Quran. Try reading a, a whole juzu every day. You're complaining about zakah. Try giving a lot of sadaqah. It doubles down on the fara'id and on the ta'at and on the obedience. And it doubles down on the haram. It makes the halal, the halal haram and it makes the fard double and triple and quadruple. Training camp for taqwa. It puts everything in action. You can't say a word in Ramadan. You're not, a, you're not allowed to say a word. And why fasting? It's even a training camp in what? In sincerity. You, nobody knows if you're fasting. You can't, how can you show off with fasting? Like even if you come and say, oh, I am fasting. Oh, how do I know? You're just now you're saying fasting. You're going to go behind the door and eat. Go to the restaurant, go home and eat. You can't show off. Fasting is the only ibadah in Islam that does not have a possibility of show off. Because you're either fasting between you and Allah, and every Muslim is fasting, so what are you going to show off? Like in Ramadan, everybody's fasting. Or you're not fasting. You cannot show off with fasting, right? I remember I was like 13 years old, like these kids here, mashallah. And I was, <laughs> and the sheikh was teaching us about there is no show off in fasting. So he told us a joke. He said someone walked into the masjid, and this guy was praying the masjid, praying the fastest, like Speedy Gonzalez, like you know, 200 miles per hour. Qiyam ruku' sujood, qiyam ruku' sujood, qiyam ruku' sujood. And this guy walks in, and what? He slows down. Two people sit behind him. So now he's like having so much khushu and salah. Long rukur, long sami Allahu liman hamida. So the two started saying, Subhanallah, this guy is like really his salah is amazing. He heard them, he got excited. He turned his face and said, And I'm fasting too. <laughs> uh, total show off, right? That's the only way you can show off if you're fasting. Like you have to say, I am fasting. Uh, otherwise it doesn't work and if you say I'm fasting in the month of Ramadan it's not a big deal like what are you implying if you say I'm fasting like you don't fast usually or something so it will work against you right it doesn't work to show off in Ramadan there's no show off there's no what show off is fasting number one number two, number th so number one fasting makes what's halal haram and doubles down on ta'at so it doubles down on haram to train you and it doubles down on obedience to train you Number two, it does not have fasting. Number three, fasting is levels. And that's what most Muslims miss. First level, physical. You deny your body food and drink and any physical desire in the days of Ramadan. Second level, the fasting of the mind. And this is where your fasting starts becoming meaningful. What are you thinking about most of the days of your life? During the day, most of the day, what are you thinking about? Some people constantly think, oh, money, money, money. Oh, my God, I didn't invest in the real estate market. Oh, my God, I did not invest in cryptocurrency. Oh, my God, I did not invest in stock market. Oh, my God, I don't have money. Oh, my God, I'm a loser. I didn't make money. Money, money, how can I make and when he went and invested, you crash the market. Look, everything is crashing right now. <laughs> Crypto, real estate, banks. Oh my God, I'm not lucky. Oh my God, I'm nobody. Oh my God, look at other people. They have money and we don't have money. And they have money and we don't have money. And constant, constant, constant. And look at their wedding. Their wedding was very expensive. Look, our wedding was very simple wedding. Oh my God. Constantly thinking. You need to have siyam. Your mind needs to fast from that, man. You need to train yourself in the days of Ramadan. You fast from thinking about anything other than Allah's pleasure. Other than Allah. Bas Allah and good amal. How can I do? How can I fix my akhirah? How can I please Allah? How can That's all what you need to think about in Ramadan. Wallahi, I've observed myself when I was younger. And then I had, because I found that I got this from the culture around me. What most Muslim men and women May Allah guide us and guide them. 
what are they thinking about during the days of Ramadan? Mothers should know that. Food and iftar. The whole day. What are you thinking about? Chicken samosa? Or beef samosa? Or vegetable samosa? I wonder. What did we eat yesterday? Assalamu alaikum, honey. What did we eat? Was it chicken samosa yesterday? And what did we eat the day before? Was it beef? Then I think today we should do what? Vegetarian samosa. Did you make did you make biryani? Oh, yesterday's biryani? No, we need today's. And the man and the woman, the whole day, what are they thinking about? Food. Yani, I think we should be ashamed of ourselves and we should be ashamed of Allah that Shahru Siyam became Shahru Ta'am. That's not okay. That's not okay. I tell my sisters and you have my full support that you need to change the culture of your home in Ramadan, follow the Sunnah. Here is something that most Muslims don't know. What is the Sunnah in Ramadan and outside Ramadan? Soup and salad. There is a hadith about soup. The Prophet Sallallahu said, if one of you any day of the year cooks food, they didn't have barbecue and this and that. They did, but they, this food was very, very rich. So they will take some bones, some meat, and they will put water, and they will make soup, and the whole family, and then they will put the bread in the soup. So if you put the bread, pour the soup on the bread, and put the meat on the top, this is called farid, the fancy food of the Arabs. Today in Palestine, we call it mansaf, but we added what? We added a layer of rice. The Arabs never ate rice. Until a hundred years ago, rice used to be a very rare um, dessert in Arabia. So the Arabs' genetics are not used to rice. So the highest level of diabetes and cancer is in Saudi Arabia because of how much rice they eat. We're not meant to eat rice. Our ancestors did not eat rice for thousands of years. But in India and in China, they ate it. So their body knows how to process it. We don't know how to process it. So the idea here is food, soup and salad, so much emphasis in the hadith, break your fast even with a water. Make suhoor, make sure you make suhoor even with a sip of water. There's so much focus on water, 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 drinking milk, drinking water and drinking soup. The Prophet ﷺ said when one of you cooks his food, let him increase the water and let him feed his neighbors. Let the whole neighborhood eat soup with you. Subhanallah. Today, science found out that our stomach to digest food, it releases acid. So your stomach is already acidic, highly acidic. That's how it kills all the germs and bacteria and digests the food. Meat by nature is also acidic. So when you eat lots of meat, it's double acidity. Subhanallah, which part of the food that is alkaline, the soup, especially when you boil the meat with the bones, the soup is alkaline. Do you know when you eat the meat with its soup, you are eating a balanced acidity food. Now only you have the acidity that your stomach releases, which is the acidity of digestion. The healthiest thing in the world is to eat soup and then salad. And the Prophet ﷺ used, in the hadith used to eat from the vegetation of Medina after Asr when he was not fasting, and after Maghrib when he was fasting, you know, and that includes carrots, parsley, uh, and uh, um, squash, and uh, cucumber. Qitha in Arabic. Okay. So, that doesn't take a long time. So, first level, the fasting of the body. Second level, the fasting of the mind. From thinking about food, and from thinking about plotting evil. Like you're thinking, how am I going to hurt her? How am I going to hurt him? How am I going to destroy his life? How am I going to destroy his life? Fasting, fasting. Your mind fasting from all of that. You're just thinking about Allah, about good deeds, about how you're going to plan your day with full of good deeds, about understanding the Quran. Third level of fasting. The fasting of the heart. From what? What are the diseases of the heart? Give me an example. I, I didn't understand what you said. Go ahead. Jealousy. jealousy. Why jealousy? Why are you jealous? Because Allah gave someone something and he didn't give it to you. So now you're jealous. 
But Allah gave you something he didn't give them to, but you don't see that. So jealousy is impoliteness with Allah because you're not happy with Allah's decision. Who did he give what? Allah gave this person beauty, physical beauty, but they are sick. But Allah made you healthy, but you don't have physical beauty. But Allah gave them money, but his children are eating his heart. But Allah gave you beautiful children, but no money. Everybody has a test. <laughs> so the idea here is what? Al-Rida, accepting what Allah Azza wa The fasting of the heart from jealousy. Right? Don't be envious from others. There's a beautiful poem written by a scholar in our history that, Oh you who is jealous, do you know who have you been impolite with? You are impolite with Allah because you are not happy with his decisions. Do you know what is the result of that? Because of your impoliteness, Allah gave me everything and Allah locked the doors in your face. <laughs> because of your impoliteness. That's a poem. Aya hasidan li fi ma utitu atadri ala man asa'at al-adab asa'at ala Allah fi sun'ihi wa annaka lam tarda li ma wahab فَكَانَ جَزَاؤُكَ أَنْ خَصَّنِي وَسَدَّ عَلَيْكَ طَرِيقَ الطَّلَبِ Beautiful. The one who give him or give her, he can give you too. So, ask Allah Azza wa Jal. Fasting of the heart from jealousy from? Huh? Miserliness? The love of dunya, you don't want to spend, you don't want to spend, you don't want to spend. Allah said, don't be tight and don't stretch your hand. And you stretch your hand all the way. You you sit down regretting. I didn't save. I didn't do this. I spent all of my money. Surah Al Isra, right? So, um, <clears throat> fasting of the mind from what? Uh, the heart. Jealousy? Ah. You know what the Prophet ﷺ said? No one will enter Jannah even if this much, the smallest seed of kibir is in their heart. لا يدخل الجنة من كان في قلبه مثقال حبة من خردل من كبر. No inner Jannah. So what does fasting do? You know when you eat that 16 ounce steak and then you drink with it and then you go and pump some iron and the night before you slept eight hours, you feel like no one can stand in your way. You are, ah, why do I need God? What? And then one mosquito, just one mosquito. I didn't know that mosquitoes are different until I went to Pakistan. I took it personal, right? And they gave you malaria for God's sake, right? And it's not a joke. Malaria. Six times I went through malaria. Six times I should have been dead. And Allah will that I live. I'm telling you. The sixth time I sat in front of the doctor, I said, "Is there no way?" And no more, no more the, no more the mosquito is biting me because now I moved to Saudi Arabia. It actually the the bug, when you take the medicine, it builds a wall around itself and it goes dormant. And then six months later, it sees okay, there is no medicine. No, no, no. It opens up. So you don't need to be stung by the mosquito again. It's in your blood. It just keeps on coming until it kills you. You know, like, you know, you know, I don't know if you know what 110, not 104, 110 degree looks like. I used to feel like there is a pressure between my skull and my brain. I feel like there was a steam, you know, Tom and Jerry, like that's what I felt literally inside my head. Subhanallah. When you get that mosquito, or an average adult human has, scientists are not sure. So if you Google it, you will find anywhere between 30 to 70 trillion cells in your body. They're not sure. So I will go, I'm not a scientist, so I will leave it to scientists. Let's go with the lower number, 30 trillion cells in your body. Just one cell mutates and the body doesn't kill it. You have cancer. There is 30 trillion reasons why you should die today. And you don't need a virus, and you don't need a bacteria, and you don't need a fungi to kill you. Your own body cell can kill you. When the mechanism 
there's every cell has a timer inside it when it dies. If it doesn't die on time, and then it starts producing other cells that don't die on time, you die. Do you know what is? Do you know when I'll, I, after I went through cancer and all of that, I, I understood an ayah in the Quran that I never understood before. Allah says, he brings the living out of the dead and the dead. Do you know what that means in the world of cancer? If your body cells don't die, if they live, you die. If they die, you live. <laughs> That's what cancer is. It's mind-blowing, right? So 30 trillion to 60 trillion reasons why you should be dead today. And finally, alhamdulillah, may Allah reward all the, guide all the Japanese. Finally, 2016, a Japanese scientist was given the Nobel Prize for his work on the cell. Please go and search it on YouTube. Put autophagy. A-U-T-O-P-H-O-G-Y. Autophagy. What autophagy means? Self-eating. He made a research on the cell. When the, the cell is pushed to eat itself, it will clear all the bad DNA. There is a bag of garbage in every cell where all the bad DNA is put. So the cell goes, takes the bad DNA, cut all the bad parts, reassembles it and uses it. And that prevents cancer from happening. So cancer preventing, blah, blah, blah. How do you, how do you do, how do you do, how do you get your body to do autophagy? Fast. Not eating. No, 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 get this. This is, it gets better. Not eating enough is not enough. You have to not eat and stress the cell. And one of the easiest way to stress the cell after not eating is not drinking. Yani <laughs> Ramadan. Please go. He's a Japanese scientist. 2016 Nobel Prize went for, I think, Yashamoto or something like that. And he, is, uh, he made the research. So it became now 1,000... 400 years we've been made fun of you Muslims are crazy you fast no eating no drinking 10 years ago they were everybody like the doctors the recommendation hydration hydration is not good now <clears throat> Hollywood is everybody is following what intermittent fasting and what are you intermittent ing two meals a day Seriously? Seriously. Yani iftar and suhoor. And the first one, like long distance, 16 hours, and the second one, 8 hours. Yani exactly iftar and suhoor. Like seriously? Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Khalas. Now we are cool. Oh, Muslim, you're fast. Oh, I wish I can do intermittent fasting. Before, when I came to Indiana, 1996, I had the weirdest questions. They still have farms and horses. Do you make your horses fast in Ramadan too? <laughs> I swear to God, in Indiana, do you make your horses fast? I'm like, what? The? Are you okay, man? Do you make your cats and dogs fast? <laughs> I I didn't know what to do. You know. Anyway, so this is exactly now nobody makes fun of us. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. So. Fasting is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's go layers. Fasting of the body. Actually, before mentioning fasting of the mind, I should have mentioned another fasting. Fasting of the body. We mentioned the mind, the heart, but between the body and the mind and the heart, the fasting of the limbs. The fasting of the eyes from looking at haram. The fasting of the ears from hearing haram. The fasting of the tongue from lying, cheating, speaking, the backbiting, gossiping, slandering, the fasting of the hands, from buying and selling and haram and touching haram, the fasting of the feet, from walking to haram. <clears throat> fasting of the body, fasting of the limbs, fasting of the mind, the fasting of the heart. We mentioned three major items, jealousy, Arrogance and um, miserliness, greediness, and kibber. Yeah, kibber. So, arrogance, hatred. How about hatred for the heart? 
extreme anger and extreme love. This is the hallmark of the modern society because so much on the phone, we don't know how to regulate human emotions. So like you don't understand, like I have to sit down and try not to be the bad guy. Two people, like, like they're 17, 18, and they want to get married and they want to get married right now. Okay. Even the Prophet Sallallahu said, you need to get a job first before you get married. Like you need to spend on this family. Like, but, but Shaykh, fast. Allah, Rasulullah said, if you can't afford it, fast. No, Shaykh, you don't understand. We have chemistry between us. I know that chemistry is a topic taught in university. I, I didn't know that it had takes place between human beings. But anyway, three months later, we're not meant for each other. We hate each other. What happened to the biology and physics and chemistry? And It's all gone out of the window. Anyway, so the idea here is extreme emotions. I want to share with you two hadith about everything we mentioned because I'm skipping so many hadith. Every point we're saying has an ayah or hadith. Number one, the Prophet ﷺ said, if, you, if someone is fasting and he's not stopping, he doesn't stop lying and bearing false witness. Did he do this? Yes, he did it. But you didn't see it. You're bearing false witness. Whosoever does not stop lying and does not stop bearing false witness, Allah has no need for him to stop eating and drinking. There is no fasting for you. You might as well go and break your fast. مَن لَمْ يَدَعَ قَوْلَ الزُّورِ وَالْعَمَلَ بِهِ فَلَيْسَ لِلَّهِ حَاجَةِ فِي أَنْ يَدَعَ طَعَامَهُ وَشَرَابَهُ Who does not stop bearing false witness and lying? Allah has no need for you to stop drinking. Go ahead, eat, eat. There is no fasting for you. This is hadith. The second hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, when one of you is fasting, it's fasting from anger, from the emotions of the heart, from extreme emotions. When one of you is fasting and someone comes and fights him, makes you angry, he wants you to break your fast. So let's have the person say, Allahumma inni sa'im. You don't talk to them anymore. Ya Allah, I'm fasting. Ya Allah, I'm fasting. Ya Allah, I'm fasting. Fasting from anger. إِذَا كَنَا يَوْمُ الصِّيَامِ أَحَدِكُمْ فَمَنْ شَاتَمَهُ فَمَنْ سَابَهُ أَوْ شَاتَمَهُ The one who comes and curses at you and calls your name. فَلْيَقُلْ اللَّهُمَّ إِنِّي صَائِمْ اللَّهُمَّ إِنِّي صَائِمْ Ya Allah, I'm fasting. Fasting from what? From anger. Fasting from extreme emotions. Right now, extremely happy, extremely sad. Extremely I love you, extremely I hate you. Like, how about middle? Fasting of the body, fasting of the limbs, mind, eyes, ears, tongue, hands, feet. Fasting of the mind, fasting of the heart. And all the sicknesses of the heart. And finally, fasting of the soul from anything other than Allah. A month of Ramadan is you and Allah. That's it, you and Allah. That's one dimension. And then you help the other Muslims because always in Islam, there is always four dimensions in any ibadah, anything that Islam talks about. Number one, the relationship between you and Allah. Number two, the relationship between you and yourself. Number three, the relationship between you and mankind. Number four, the relationship between you and Allah's creation. Always in any teachings in Islam. Look, you, you want to pray to Allah. What do you do? It's between you and Allah. No, it's not between you and Allah. You have to come to the masjid and pray with the Muslims. R Salah is a relationship between you and Allah, a relationship between you and yourself, a relationship between you and the believers, and a relationship between you and Allah's creation. On the way to the masjid, you see a cat that is dying from hunger, or you feed it. A dog, you feed it. A bird, you feed it. Get out of your house. Oh, but I'm praying to Allah. Yeah, but this is not only a relationship between you and Allah. I am fasting. Oh, you're fasting with the Muslims and breaking your fast with the Muslims. And better to get your body to the masjid and pray taraweeh and see the Muslims and help them and give the poor and give the miskeen. Oh, I'm going to hajj. I'm going alone. There is no going to hajj alone. You have to go with the jama'ah and perform hajj with the jama'ah and go when it's crowded and you're going to get pushed and you're going to get sweaty and people would and you have to be patient and smile and say, it's okay, I forgive you. 
because every relationship of ibadah in Islam, every pillar establishes a relationship between you and Allah, a relationship between you and yourself, a relationship between you and the believers and the human beings in general, and the relationship between you and Allah's creation, between you and the birds, you and the cats, you and the dogs, you and the fish, you and all the trees, you and the environment. In every relationship, there is these four dimensions. Because Allah created you for ibadah, that's between you and Allah, and Allah created you for khilafa. that's you yourself, you human beings, you and Allah's creation. Are we good? So, we're almost done. Alhamdulillah, that was fascinating. I'm going to go with the... So we covered what? Number one, what is the month of Ramadan? Number two, what is the Quran? Number three, what is fasting? Bye. Number four, we didn't cover number four. Inshallah, do would you like a break? Jazakumullah khair. What time is it? Twelve twenty. Tayyib. Uh twelve forty? Twenty minutes? Nineteen minutes? It's already twenty twenty one. So twelve forty, so that will give us from twelve forty to one twenty, and then we'll break for salah, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. MashaAllah, may Allah bless you. Shukran. Thank you. Ramadan is independent from fasting and you can get all the blessings of Ramadan whether you're fasting or not that's really uh, alhamdulillah that I was and I you know I try my best to always tie myself to the word of Allah and the sunnah of his prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam but um, <clears throat> alhamdulillah that you are finding this beneficial we had a very beautiful questions from our young sisters, Tayyiba and Tahseen, mashallah. And um, from the rest of you. Uh, but maybe we, maybe you have a question that others can benefit from the answer to. Um, if you have a question, Bismillah. What are the best or some good deeds that a believer can do in Ramadan? Did I understand the question? Mm. Um, if the woman is on her period, in the 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 answer in the world of fiqh. We have the four madhahib, and we have the madhab of what we call Ahlul Hadith, the people who directly take from Hadith. But even within the Hanbali madhab, if we stay within the four madhab, I believe, and this is not my opinion because this is, I'm not qualified. I have to be like close to Imam Abu Hanifa or Imam Malik or Shafi to give an opinion, and I'm not nowhere close to there. But I believe that when a woman is on her period, she is not forbidden to touch the Qur'an or read the Qur'an. And Ramadan is the month of the Qur'an. Within the fiqh, Maliki and Shafi'i and this, they will say yes, you're not supposed. But in the hadith, Aisha said we used to hold the Qur'an with pieces of cloth. Like for example, if you're, you know, and you have to understand that at the time of the Prophet وسلم, also the means of, you know, if you are in a state of bleeding, you don't want to go to the masjid. They did not have these modern technologies and all of that. But the idea here is, it's, it's a long answer. I don't know if I start giving it, if I will stop. But it's particularly about, I was contemplating for a while, when I, like 10 years ago, about this issue of, women and praying, women and fasting when they are going through the period. 
and what does that mean and why is that happening and I try to keep, keep on going back to ayat and hadith ayat and hadith and I was blown away with what I saw and my opinion is not a fiqhi opinion but rather a reflection just a reflection so I'm going to share something with you when a woman is on her period, she does not pray. When a woman is on her period, she does not fast. Let's put the fasting aside. Let's take prayers. This deen, the same deen, was from Allah. Allah is not a male or female. And Allah said, I created the male and female. And Allah says, I do not prefer males over females or females over males. Let's look at the structure of Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, does Allah give an excuse for a believer, man or woman, not to pray if they don't have an excuse? Like, let's put the period aside. Is there any? So, for example, I need to pray, but I cannot stand up. Can I skip prayers? What do I do? I cannot sit down. I cannot lie down. Okay, so I can use. Okay, so I can. If I can use, move my head. Okay, so I'm totally paralyzed. I cannot move my head. What do I do? I cannot move my eyes. With my heart. I cannot make wudu. I cannot make tayammum. Intention. So if I cannot make tayammum, and I cannot make wudu, uh, move my body, so I cannot make wudu or tayammum, or move my body, I still pray. Taib, I feel I'm getting close to death. I feel like my soul is leaving my body. Shall I skip prayers? Taib. I'm in a battle, and I'm about to lose the time of prayers. The army prays in a way that half of the army protects the other half, and if you cannot, you pray on the back of your horse, while the horse is running. You understand? Taib, I'm too old. I'm old, but I'm aware of everything. Is that an excuse for me not to pray? Taib. I am sick. I don't know. I went through car accident. Taib, I am bleeding. Obviously, the Hanafi madhab says if you are bleeding, you lose your wudu. But the other madhab don't. Because Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab was leading Salat al-Fajr and he was stabbed 17 times. And he did not stop the prayers. If Sayyidina Umar Khattab believed that blood gushing out breaks your wudu, he would have stopped the prayers and let someone else lead. But he didn't do that. So bleeding does not break your wudu. Are we good? But if you are a Hanafi, again, I don't have the turban of Imam Abu Hanifa, right? Imam Abu Hanifa is Imam Abu Hanifa and the Madhab al-Hanafi is a Madhab of Ahl al-Sunnah wal-Jama'ah built on Quran and Sunnah. We're not here to put down any Madhab. These people have served the Islam more than we can ever imagine. Tab, I'm bleeding. My wudu does not break. Tab, but I am, and, 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 and maybe I'm bleeding to death. That's exactly what Sayyidina Umar al Khattab. He kept on bleeding, he finished Salat al Fajr, then he died. After a while, he didn't die right away from the stabs. It took slow, slow. You understand? Because he, he, he's like, if I'm dying <laughs> and I'm bleeding, then I might always finish my salah and meet my Lord with my salah done. So I'm going to ask you a question. If Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab is bleeding, and if the Sahaba in the middle of the battle, they're bleeding, and they're still praying, so then can it be that the woman is not praying because of bleeding? It cannot be. Because if you're bleeding outside of that period, you still pray. Like for example, I don't know, you have internal bleeding, something, and you are in the hospital and they're watching you. And the time of salah comes. You say, I'm in internal bleeding, I'm not going to pray. You pray. It makes sense, logically, when you don't fast while in your period because you're bleeding, so there's so much liquid, and you add to that dehydration, you're going to die. That's going to kill you, and ibadah was never meant to kill you. So with fasting, bleeding and not fasting makes sense. But with prayers, there is an irreconcilable point. The same God that says, if you're dying, you pray. 
If you're sick, you pray. If you're paralyzed from the head down and you cannot make wudu or tayammum or a single movement in your body, you still pray. Is the same God that is telling the woman when you're in your period, you don't have to pray. Something is not reconciling. And the only way that I can reconcile it is looking at the reason of the bleeding of the period. The reason of the bleeding of the period is that Allah Azza wa Jal put the burden of carrying the baby on the woman, not on the man. So what is the period? The period is the egg is getting ready for life. So the womb builds all the readiness so that this egg can be fertilized. So it doesn't get fertilized. It's a life ready to go, and then the life does not have. So the life dies. The egg dies. And when it dies, it collapses with it, the wall of the womb, and it comes out in a form of a period. Do you know what the period is? The period is a human. We call the woman a human, full human being, experiencing the entire cycle of life and death inside them. And Allah put that on you. And Allah knows what you're going through. So in my humble judgment, the closest a woman is to Allah is when she's on her period. Because you're so close, you don't have to pray. But you don't see it that way. Because you are a human, right? And a human cannot go without five daily prayers. Like you have to understand, it's the same God, it's the same deen, it's the same religion, the same God who's telling you, you could be dying, you need to pray, you could be stabbed to death, you need to pray, is telling you, in this case, you don't have to pray. Someone needs to be thinking about something. This is the same, so what is Allah is telling you, I am punishing you because you're going through your period? I hate you, I don't want you to talk to me. No, what our sisters do not understand is that they are the closest to Allah Azza wa Jal and their dua is the most answered. They're so close that Allah pardoned you from prayer itself. Now it's up to you to find that closeness when you go through the prayers or to believe the talks of shaitan and the talks of this and something that we don't have in our faith. You're filthy. You're filthy. You're filthy. You're not, no, no, you're not Tahira. You're not, you're in the state of Najasa. You're, okay. you're talking about the Mus'haf. How about the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, whose the Quran was revealed to him? He's walking out of his house in the morning. He sees Abu Huraira from the end of the road. Abu Huraira sees the Prophet and runs away. That does not like, look like Abu Huraira. An hour later, Abu Huraira shows up. Rasulullah said, why did, why did you run away? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm sorry. I was in the state of Janaba. In state of Janaba. يعني, and I did not want to shake your hand. You are the one that the Quran is revealed to you. I don't know. Rasulullah said, don't do that again. Don't you know, Ya Abu Huraira, that the believer is tahir la yanjus? The believer is always in the state of Tahara. Najasa in the Quran is associated with Kufr and Shirk. So what did Allah say? In the Quran, إِنَّمَا الْمُشْرِكُونَ نَجَسْ فَلَا يَقْرَبُ الْمَسْجِدَ الْحَرَامَ بَعْدَ عَامِهِمْ هَذَا The mushrikeen are in the state of Najasa. They cannot come into the vicinity, the zone of Al-Masjid Al-Haram. So najasa is associated with kufr. When you are a Muslim man or a Muslim woman, you don't get in a state of najasa. So take out of your mind that you are najas. Take out of your mind that you are filthy. Take out of your mind that you are punished. Take out of your mind that you are, Allah doesn't want to talk to you. Take out of your mind that you are any less. And put in your mind the book of Allah and the sunnah of his prophet وسلم, that tells you you do not have to pray and you do not have to fast. Do you know how super close to Allah you have to be for you not to pray and fast? <laughs> That's my personal reflection. 
I have not heard, learned it from any alim or scholar. I have not read this from anyone. This is my own personal reflection. And I could be right and I could be wrong. But to me, this is the only way it reconciles in my head. So, when you are on your period, you are on steroids. <laughs> like you are clo crazy close to Allah. Read Quran, make dua for the rest of us. Make dua for your spouse, make dua for your children, make dua for your parents, make dua for your brothers and sisters. Make dua because I just cannot process how Allah gave women a week to two weeks in any given month of them not praying. That's beyond me. I I will like to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about this on the day of judgment. Because you know, when people say Islam is pro men, I can stand up here and say it's not fair. <laughs> How come you guys can't don't have to pray for a week or two and we don't have a, Islam is against men? I can build for you a very good case that Islam is against men. Who has to go and die in war? You can go and die, no problem. You're disposable. She stays here. <laughs> That's not fair. She doesn't have to fast a week or two in Ramadan. She doesn't have to pray a week or two in the month. And I'm the one who has to go through that. Why? So don't let them attack you like that. Subhanallah. Yani this is a deen in which every man and woman, their deen is not complete unless they go to hajj, if they can afford it. And in hajj, you're not complete, incomplete, without doing sa'i between Safa and Marwa. And sa'i between Safa and Marwa is following the footsteps of a woman. And they put the poison in our head. Islam is against women. Islam is against women. The teaching of Islam is against women. This is, this is Islam, please. In a different law, in the uh, Jewish Mishnah and this, when a woman is on her period, she has to isolate herself. She cannot touch. If she touches this, a spoon, and she gives it to her husband, and the husband touches what the wife touched while she's on her period, the husband cannot pray the whole day and he can only start praying at night when he takes a shower. So within orthodoxy, Judaism, a woman has to isolate herself for a whole week or two weeks while she's going through her period. Because whatever she touches, no one else can touch. If she sits on a place and the husband sits on it, he cannot pray the whole day until the evening, then he takes a shower, then he can pray. We don't have that in Islam. Just so that you know. And this, what I'm telling you, is verifiable. You can find, and, and I'm not making fun of anyone, disrespecting anyone. This is their teachings of their faith. This is how they understand it. That's between them and their God. But I'm saying this is not Islam. This is not our practice. Simply, just like we don't worship idols, we don't do this. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar kabira wa alhamdulillahi kathira wa subhanallahi bukratan wa asila. If any one of you have a reflection or a different answer, I would please go ahead. There's. Yeah. No. We can um, we can make the good. Uh -huh. We can give charity. We can serve the community. Mm -hmm. uh, we can do everything, mm -hmm. but but the salah and fasting during Ramadan. And there's so much that we can do. Yeah. Salah definitely. Allah says you don't pray, so you take it and be happy with it. Allah said you don't fast, you take it and you'll be happy with it. I don't believe a woman, for example, if you want to enjoy taraweeh, but you cannot pray, I would say you come. In the place of musalla, you don't come in because that's where people are praying. You're going to sit down there, you, people are going to look why she's sitting down. So in order not, but in the back you can sit down and be in the masjid and serve Muslims and listen to Quran. I do not believe that it is haram for you to read Quran. And I, this is not my opinion. This is an old opinion. And it's not an opinion. It's like the fiqh opinion built on hadith and ayat. And uh, not everyone, as majority probably will disagree with this opinion in the history of Islam. But I say you can read Quran. You can do your khatim. You can recite Quran from memory. Or you can read it from the book of Allah. I don't see a problem with that. But you have to know majority, like at least let's say majority in uh, uh, countries that follow Hanafi madhab, they don't agree with that, and I respect that. I have zero disagreement with that.
but you just have to know that this also exists in the books. Yeah. May Allah bless you. So just, you know, obedience to Allah by itself, not doing what He told us not to do is... Exactly. Exactly. And, and, and as you said, like look at the, the big ram. There was a time in the hadith, it was Ramadan. And Muslims were fasting. And they were traveling. So a group of Muslims broke their fast and set up the whole camp for the one who's fasting. The Prophet Wasallam said, today the one who wrapped up all the reward and sawab are the people who broke their fast. <laughs> Because they served everyone. So when you can serve everyone else, you're getting your thawab and the thawab of everyone else. Plus, I love how Rasulullah found us a way out of everything. You're fasting. You're not fasting, okay? You find someone who's really, really, really needy, not someone who's richer than you. <laughs> really, really needy. And give them iftar. What did Rasulullah say? You, would, they, you will get their thawab too. As if you fasted that day. So there is a way around it, getting the sawab without fasting. Um, yeah, I mean, we just, we just enjoy it. Someone asked uh, Sayyidah Aisha, huh, how come we women, when we are on our period, we don't fast and we don't pray? But we make up the fasting, or, but we don't make up the prayers. She said, get out of here. <laughs> And you're, you're trying to rationalize Allah's commands, who's above us. It's not a question. So this is we just follow and we accept. But I'm telling you, there is a huge secret that I, I can't reconcile. It's a time for you. Dhikr, dua. I was trying to record yesterday like a whole series like for one to be released once. By the way, the details of what I, everything I said today is also about to be released in 30 series um, about the Ramadan and fasting and all everything we talked about, but broken into small chunks so that you can watch it one by one. So inshallah, it uh, will be released on my personal YouTube and this and that and Tawasa YouTube and uh, all of that. So inshallah, yani I'm trying to put the stuff out there, but one of the most fascinating thing that we don't take advantage of is dua, dua, dua. Once you dive into this topic of dua, it blows your mind. Like, it blows your mind. Like, it's, it's something that Muslims don't use and don't... Because, like, let me give you just a, a quick uh, smell. We Muslims have translated the idea that one of the six pillars of Iman is to believe in divine destiny. We translated it to, I am helpless, I cannot do anything, Allah decided my life, nothing can change, I'm doomed. <sighs> helplessness and hopelessness. When actually, the topic of divine destiny, it's supposed to be the most energizing, empowering topic. Why? Because in the Quran, Allah explains to you, there are certain things that are 100% under my control your date of birth, your date of death, how tall, how short, how wide, how skinny. What's your picture here? What's your, your face looks like? Allah chose that for you. Skin color, language, where were you born? Who were your parents? You didn't decide any of that. 100% under Allah's control. And none of these items, Allah will ask you about them on the day of judgment. Why were you this tall? Why were you this short? Why were you this white? Why were you this black? No, no, has nothing to do. There's another area that is 100% under your control. Your thoughts, your intentions, your words and actions. These four are 100% under your control. There's another circle of 50-50. Allah throws something at you in life and Allah looks at your reaction. This is where most of our life happens. This is when the Muslims say, oh, this was Allah's destiny. Like when we are about to get married. Like so, someone said, Oh, خلاص, I'm going to get married to him. Why? It's nasib. Nasib what? <laughs> it's a choice. It's a choice. Oh, at the end, Allah knows everything, but it's a choice. Did you ask about his deen? Did you ask about his adab and akhlaq? Did you ask he has a job to provide for the family? 
What, what destiny are you talking about? It's totally your choice. Where are the list of your questions? Where are your requirements, man or woman, right? What do you want from, from the marriage? What do you want in the other person? Who are their family? How did they grow up? What's their environment? Who they are hanging out with? It's a long homework before you sign your life away in marriage. What is... Oh, it's not Qismat al nasib Someone knocked the door and said, can I marry your daughter? And you said, yes. It's a choice. It's not a forced upon you. Okay? Now, number two. In this world of choices, as life happening, destiny is coming out. So I tell people, if you're driving on the highway like a maniac, crazy, and you end up with a car accident, you have only yourself to blame. But if you're driving good on the highway, and someone comes and hits you from the back and paralyzes you from the neck down. I actually know a brother, may Allah Azza wa Jal heal him and reward him from his sabr. This now, by now happened 20 years ago. Wallahi, yani, it, that is when you say this is qadar. Then you say when you say. He's on this side of the highway and there's the other car is on the other side of the highway and it's on 152 between San Jose and uh, when you go down in the valley after uh, uh, Los Banos and before Chowchilla. So the, the space between the two lanes, there is like a farm in the middle. Yani at least 500 feet between the two lanes. And he's driving. Someone from the other side loses control of the car. Imagine, car is speeding. The car makes a full U-turn and comes and hits him from the back. And he gets paralyzed from the neck now. Type. What is this? This is called test from Allah Azza wa So now Allah will look at how you react. Type. This destiny, this active destiny that happens every year. How much money am I going to make this year? How much... Like, what, am I going to get married or not? Am I going to have children or not? Am I, uh, all destiny. What if, whatever you want to happen next year or you don't want to happen next year, Allah gives you access, access to effect and design what's going to happen next year in your life. This area, we don't usually have access to it. It's totally designed by Allah. But Allah gives you once a year access to it. And that's Laylatul Qadr. Do you know what Laylatul Qadr is? Laylatul Qadr is you making dua while the destiny is being made and decided. And while it's coming down from the sky down onto the real world, you're sending powerful dua, which is also a destiny. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa literally, literally said, لا يرد القدر إلا الدعاء أنا نظر لا يرد القضاء إلا الدعاء both قضاء and قدر which means divine destiny and divine will nothing pushes back destiny like دعاء basically you have the power to stop something from happening that was written on you to happen but you say but if it was written then it should have happened because Allah wrote it on me no 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 you don't understand Allah design destiny and that's from Allah and you making dua is a destiny and that also has access to Allah so Allah gets to decide which of the two destinies beat the other one your dua beats the destiny or your destiny beats that your dua so that's why if you love yourself have a good Ramadan from the beginning anticipate Laylatul Qadr make some serious whole dua about your health, about your money, about your family members, about everything, and keep on saying, Ya Allah, I ask you, if there is anything harmful that is destined for me this coming year, you don't make it happen. And if this is anything good that is, was not destined for me, make it happen. And Allah will answer your dua. So the Prophet wasallam in another hadith said, some, the dua is going up and the qada is coming down. They fight each other in the sky until the day of judgment, which means it will never happen in the real world because your dua stopped the destiny from happening. It will struggle with each other in the sky. If your dua is strong and sincere, it will push it back. If it is equal to the destiny, it will fight it and it won't happen. And if your dua is weak, 
the destiny will beat your dua. So what's the solution? Put your heart into it. And that's probably the last piece that I wanted to share with you. It happened in the form of a question. Uh, is the idea is the month of Ramadan is the month of dua. Make your own destiny. You know, that sounds like very American, right? <laughs> it doesn't sound like a sheikh talking, right? We make our own destiny. Astaghfirullah. Yeah, yeah, we don't make it. We make dua to Allah who designs destiny to make it for us. That's how we make it. Like we, we send a request. Please, ya Allah, make this happen. Please, ya Allah, don't make this happen. And Allah will do it. So I'm not saying, like the Americans, believe in yourself. Believe in yourself all that you want. <laughs> it's not going to help. You can't help yourself. When you go to the doctor and the doctor says you have this sickness and we don't have any treatment for it, believe in yourself all that you want when the doctor tells you that. It's not going to help. We don't believe in ourselves. We believe in Allah. I see myself. I don't need to believe in myself. I, I already see it. <laughs> right? So the idea here is, um, that's, uh, and that's, that's basically uh, emphasis on Laylatul Qadr and the power of Laylatul Qadr. Uh, I tell people, yes, there is hadith. Yes, there is hadith about the night of the middle of Sha'ban. The only thing that I found that in our cultures we exaggerated, added, fabricated that the night of the middle of Sha'ban is the night that Allah decides your rizq and destiny for next year. That flies against the ayat of the Quran. That's not even flies against hadith. So the night of the middle of Sha'ban, there is a hadith. Together they could make each other strong that you, Allah is a night of forgiveness. Allah offers his forgiveness. So you can fast in that day, pray that night, no problem. It's weak hadith with weak hadith with weak hadith. With weak, and they become together, they become strong. That's fine. Hasanun li ghayri, yashuddu ba'duhu ba'dan. That's fine. But that's not the night of Al-Qadr. Then people exaggerate and send you text messages on WhatsApp. Make dua, it's the night your rizq is decided. No, that's not the right your rizq is decided. That's Laylatul Qadr. Allah said in the Quran, Fiha yufraqu kullu amrin hakim. In that day, Allah separates, sorts out, decides all commands that comes from Him. Amram min indina, a command from us, like for Allah to be clear with you. This is all Allah's business. So while Allah is deciding your destiny for next year, you make dua for Him. He will fix your destiny. And that's what we don't know, that Allah can change destiny. Before it happens, while it happens, after it happens. So Sayyidina Yunus السلام, what should have happened to Yunus? He should have should have been digested. So after he was thrown from the ship and he was supposed to drown, he was swallowed by the whale, and he's getting digested in the middle of the stomach of the whale, Allah told to the whale, kick him out. It's never too late with Allah. It's never too late. Sayyidina Yunus, in his wildest, wildest dreams, never thought that he's going to get out of that whale stomach. But he got out of it. And when he got out of it, he was half digested. You know that. That's why Allah said, Allah grew a tree from yaqteen. And this tree has big leaves and it's insect repellent. Why? Because he was on the beach on, in Iraq. It's crazy hot and the acid has already started digesting his skin and with the sun he would have died on the beach so Allah made a tree grow until he dried and he washed himself uh, and then he walked back to his people <laughs> so he had to go through some recovery room you know after surgery you have to go through recovery he went through recovery room on the beach with a tree which means it's never too late like if you feel that you've done something wrong and Allah is punishing you, oh boy, oh boy, that's the time for you to make dua. You got Yunus alayhi salam as your role model. Allah can get you out of your misery and put you on the top back again. It's never too late. When it's too late, when the soul leaves your body or start leaving your body or when the sun rises from the east, from the west, right? So that's, that's according to the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Is that good? Any other question? Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. So we covered the month of Ramadan, Al-Quran Al-Kareem, fasting, taqwa, 
taqwa is to avoid Allah's wrath. And fasting is all about taqwa, right? You, you do not do. Fasting is the only ibadah in Islam that it consists of not doing. So if I say, what is salah? Salah is qiyam and ruku' and sujood. But if I, I ask a Muslim, what do you do when you are fasting? Like, what is fasting? You tell him, we do not eat, we do not drink, and we do not mate during the day of Ramadan. Because there is nothing to do. Fasting is not a ibadah of doing, it's a ibadah of not doing. Not a ibadah of action, a ibadah of inaction. You understand? Which makes it very unique. Very, 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 very unique. And that's why you cannot measure it like the rest of your deeds. That's why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said that Allah said, all the actions of the son of Adam, son of Adam, yani us, men and women, all the actions is for them. They do one good deed, Allah rewards them 10, 200, to 700, to what? No? Except fasting. It doesn't go 10 to 1. 10 to 1 what? Is there a rak'ah? There is no rak'ah. Is there tawaf and sa'i? There is no tawaf and sa'i. Is there, I give 1,000 zakah? There is no 1,000 zakah. 10 to 1 for what? There is no 10 to 1. إِلَّا الصِّيَامْ فَهُوَ لِي وَأَنَا أَجْزِي بِهِ it's for me and I reward for it. That's why the reward of fasting is abundance. That's why Allah in the Quran in Jannah says, Kulu washrabu in Jannah, eat and drink honey and bima aslaftum fil ayyam al khaliya. Congratulations for what you have done in the early days. What did you do in the early days? You didn't eat and drink. So in Jannah, Allah tells you, eat and drink now. That's why there is a bab in Jannah, you enter, babul ish. Arrayan, the people who used to fast, they enter from that bab. The abundance of the reward of fasting is unbelievable. It doesn't go ten to one; it goes infinity to one. Like it's only Allah knows what's going on. You understand? So be excited. I have one advice to you: do not start the month of Ramadan with a defeated spirit. This is what I hear from people: Oh my God, Sheikh, Ramadan is going to come, and I'm working, and I'm going to be very tired, and then we don't sleep. I don't get to drink my coffee, and you know, Sheikh, we have tests and we have finals. And, uh, what is this? <laughs> You're dead on arrival, man. You died before Ramadan started, man. Take it easy. You know what I'm saying? Can you get a little bit excited, a little bit? What's the problem? You didn't fast, you didn't sleep enough hours at night. Sleep in the day. Sleeping in the day is ibadah. Sleeping in the day is mentioned in the Quran as ayah, as miracle. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ خَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ one of Allah's ayat is that you sleep in the day and in the night. At night and the day. So you, didn't, you slept four or five hours in the night, sleep two hours in the day, there goes seven hours. You're done. Eat less, drink more in Ramadan, you're done. You eat solid food, solid food, solid food, and you don't drink water, you blow your kidneys. Yani, eat Drink more than eating in Ramadan. Keep on drinking, 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 drinking. You know, I love how our cultures made so many things around the country. Like in Palestine, we do apricot drink. We call it Qamar al din That's the name of that drink. In Pakistan, you have Ruha Afza, right? It's the hallmark of Ramadan. Ruha Afza. No Ruha Afza, no Ramadan. No fasting. But look, it goes with liquid. Go with it. Drink the milk. But don't keep on eating meat, 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 meat. Yani, Ramadan is the month of fasting. Your, your diet year-round is fancy. Can it go just humble one month? Rasulullah sallallahu his diet year-round is simple and in Ramadan simpler. Year-round fancy, in Ramadan fancier. And it cannot be. And our sisters, you need, you need to get out of this mood of I'm going to spend four or five hours every day cooking. No. You're going to spend four or five hours reading Quran, Raising the kids, learning tafsir, learning your deen. And an hour or two before iftar, you're going to get up, make soup, salad, simple stuff. Even rice, what does it take? Ten minutes? Just done and that's it. Train your family this idea of we're going to be the whole day thinking about food. This is not fasting. You know, there is people who fast for the sake of Allah. And there is the people who fast to break their fast. It's a huge difference. 
When you're thinking about food the whole day, that means you were fasting to break your fast. When you're thinking about Allah the whole day, that means you were fasting for the sake of Allah. So it's not a joke. I feel like I joke about it in this, but I feel entire Ummah, 1.8 Muslims, 1.8 billion Muslims, and they keep on wasting Ramadan, one Ramadan after another. Our brothers and sisters in Niger, seven Ramadans ago, they were dying from hunger while fasting. Because they're like, okay, we're dying from hunger, we're dying from hunger, we're going to fast. While in the Gulf countries and in the North African countries, we're throwing food in the garbage. What is this? In the same month, in, for the same ummah, in the same continent, what is this? Haram. So, يعني, there is no lack of problems right now. Hasbi Allah and Amal Wakil, they're destroying us one country at a time. Syria, Yemen, Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya. You know, the, the list is going. People now in Egypt don't like. What do you do when you wake up one day and the one dollar was equal 15 jinnah? Then you wake up the next day, it's worth 32 jinnah. In one day, you lose half of the value of your money. How do you survive as a household? That's in Egypt. And this is no war in Egypt. What do you do in Sudan? What do you do in Somal? What do you do in Niger? What do you do in Nigeria? What do you do? You know, so it's, it's a, it, we have to be like really think I'm going to, it cannot be that our food budget in Ramadan goes higher. There is a problem with that. It's not a joke. Allah will ask you about that on the Day of Judgment. Your food budget in Ramadan should go less because you're not eating three times a day, you're eating two times a day. And you're eating less. We need to fear Allah with these things because it's not a joke. We need to change our household planning in order to match the spirit of Ramadan. Fasting does not mean you eat more. Fasting at least means you eat normal or less, but not more. It's a mind-boggling that we gain weight in Ramadan. That's not acceptable. We have to put our foot down for the sake of Allah, say enough is enough for the sake of Allah, prefer Allah's pleasure over our culture, and take a stand and do it. Because without that, we will never change. And Allah, every Ramadan, looks at the Muslim Ummah, one is dying from hunger and one is dying from overweight. Unacceptable. It's not a joke. It's not a joke. It's not a joke. We have to change. And we have to change this Ramadan and we're not going to delay it to another Ramadan.